Okay, uh, I'm, we are calling the person who is responsible for the recording of the, the speeches. Uh, but uh, first of all, I will uh, ask uh, Professor uh, Franca to, to, to say a couple of words before we start. Okay, uh, good morning and welcome to IHC and to this team day. I'm here just to say a few words. <laughs> the, the, the main show is responsibility from Alessandra and Miroslav. But um, I, I was asked to say a few words and I'm happy that we organized here at IHC Delft under the auspices of NCK and NCR this day. Um, we are trying to develop a new agenda in hydropower here at IHC, so this is quite relevant for us. And especially in our group, and a bit led by, by Miroslav, we try to develop some new research projects with consortiums in hydropower in general, but also low, lead, low head hydropower. We have a new master's in, um, in hydropower coming, I think, starting next year with the University of Kuala Lumpur. And uh, we have been active also in World Water Week and uh, other instances in defining new ways of hydropower. And it's all related with new hydropower. Low, low head is one, one of the examples, and it's very, I'm happy that we can have this event here, and I'm happy that we have, uh, well, the room, well, not completely full, but quite full, more than we, we expected, actually, so and I'm quite happy with that. Um, we seem to have a very nice program. I, I, I saw the program, it's varied. There's some international experience as well there, and they cover also some design and final product. So I think it, it will be interesting. I hope we have nice discussions today. And uh, I think I just, uh, the only thing I have to say is just to present, I was given the honor to present the first speaker, it's Miroslav Marens. So uh, he's an associate professor here, as I told you, he's a specialist in hydropower, hydro structures, and uh, he's the main, uh, main responsible for the de developments that we have here at IHE. So he's also an engineer in a company Poidi in Austria, so he's very experienced worldwide in hydropower, so I think he's a an excellent member also to, to discuss with him today. So I welcome once again, and okay, I have a nice and rich day, so and hopefully we'll come out with something else of this day, okay? Thank you very much for the presence, and wish you a good day. So, uh, thank you, Maria, thank you for the introduction words. Uh, before I will start uh, my presentation about introductory about the, about the, about the hydropower, I uh, would like to make some uh, some uh, organization note. And the first one, the every everybody of you have the the, the program. We will try to to, to to make it on the on the way. Uh, I really uh, like that. Uh, that the all speakers try to, to, to be in the in the bounds of the of the given time, uh, and uh, we we have a very very tight program we can say, and after twelve thirty then we will have one hour for, for lunch, and uh, uh, part of us uh, will then go to the to the site visit to the to the power plant the small hydropower plant in San Michel Pistel. And uh, on the domel, and then uh, we will also see the kinetic turbine, and then in the evening we will come here. Plan is eighteen uh, is six o'clock in the evening, because of the traffic. Based on the experience from last year, I hope that it will not be more than half an, half an hour later. We can say. Uh, okay, so this is about the program. Uh, this is uh, the content of uh, of our system. We will we will speak the, before break this morning. We will speak about the uh, river hydropower potential, the kinetic energy of the rivers, and then we uh, after the break after the coffee break we will have the part uh, the block with the coastal engineering where the most uh, type it will be about wave current and, and uh, tidal tidal energy, and we will see some of different examples there. The site visit, as I said, we will go from IG to, to, to the Dommel to see the power plant. After that, on the way back, we will go to Zaltommel and we will see uh, uh, you know, the, the, the kinetic turbine. I think it's not, not in the water, it's just outside. 
but uh, but uh, at least we will we will see it and then from there there, will, there is a possibility to take the train home for for external participants or to go with us by bus back to the to the to the IG to the dev. Just uh, uh, one additional uh, organization point. We are now here on IG. Here is the railway station, and uh, the bus will be situated here in this new new parking area, which is which is reached there. Uh, the Google Map is still not updated. It's, it's it is not not seen, and it will be somewhere somewhere here. Okay, the lowland uh, river hydropower. Uh, I will start with uh, with the lecture. What is hydropower? We can say the hydropower is a renewable uh, uh, source of energy. It's a technology which is innovative and a tailor-made system solution. This means in most cases for each site, for each, uh, each project, we have a tailor-made solution. It's not the, 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 we can say each power plant is a prototype. In most cases, there, there is no serial production. It is, it is done on the way that every time it is, uh, it is, uh, pay, uh, it is it is based in the in the in the given system. This can be environment. This environment can be political, uh, economical, uh, uh, ecological, social, and it always need to be adapted. It, hydropower means long term uh, investment. The hydropowers today we have power powers, powerhouse with uh, power plants which are hundred years old and which are still in operation with some small. Refurbishments, in most cases, they are they are still uh, working with the, with nearly the same uh, same efficiency as it was uh, it is it is now. It create they create a, uh, additional economical value. This is this is without any discussion, and it's um, the most efficient energy generation technology. The the efficiencies what we can have with the classical hydropower are above ninety percent, which which is more than any any other pos uh, possible technology. And it's reliable, sustainable energy source, with uh, uh, which is in, in line with the with the climate change. We can see here the two graphs which shows the the development from 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 now. We can say uh, expected development in the in the energy consumption and energy production. Better to say, uh, we hope that uh, the, the fossil uh, energy sources will drop down. Hydropower, you see it here as a darkest part uh, of the of the of the graph, uh, dark blue, will increase, but very slowly because it's it's built on uh, the capacity is built and the in the uh, is is uh, potential is nearly uh, used, especially in, in uh, developed countries, and we see a lot of increase in the uh, solar and wind power, which is set. What is interesting to say is that the, the ratio between construction energy and the production, if we say how much energy we, we must put in the power plant to, uh, to, to build the power plant, and then how much energy we get in the life, uh, life cycle back, we can say that the hydropower and nuclear power are the, are the most powerful uh, energy sources because the, this ratio becomes to 1 to 250 or, or, or 200. Then the coal goes back. Wind energy, we see here, it's much more lower ratio. And the uh, and, uh, solar panels are now, with, in this diagram, to ratio 1 to 6. Now they came to 1 to 20. But before 10, 15 years, they were negative. You have, pro you have to produce the solar panels. You need more energy than, than you ever get out from the production. Hydropower is also the, uh, the, the, the heart of the uh, renewable family. The most of renewable energy is is in hydropower, and if we look to this uh, to this graph, the less adjustable or less predictable energies like solar, uh, wind, and and wave energy uh, uh, are less uh, predictable. Hydropower is predictable, and for example, the other renewables like biothermal or geothermal are just base load system. This means they are working uh, uh, 24 seven. Level as, uh, if you look to the level as cost of uh, electricity, then the, the hydropower has a uh, uh, relatively and very low uh, um, uh, levelized cost of electricity. The same is also the life cycle emission, uh, CO, CO2 emissions or, or, or greenhouse gases emissions. Hydropower globally, 
The installed capacity now is approximately uh, 1,200, 1,300 gigawatt expected 2050 to come to, to, to 2,000 gigawatts for uh, more than 4,000 terawatt hours energy is produced. Where this energy is mostly produced, the hydropower in China, United States, Brazil, Canada, and then the rest of the world. And if we look to the potential of the, uh, of the, of the hydropower in the world, we can see that in developed world, uh, especially Europe, uh, and Australia, uh, also also uh, North America, the capacity is uh, nearly. We 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 have capacity which we reached the the, the installed capacity reached nearly to the borders, but the big potential we still have in Southeast Asia, Asia, and especially in, in Africa. And these are the places in South America, of course, we have uh, we, where the hydropower will develop in future. <coughs> Hydropower in Netherlands, it's in insignificant role. The total is, uh, installed capacity is 30, 38 megawatt. If you look, uh, look to the oil production, the most is done by fossil gas and, uh, and the hard coal. And then rest uh, energies are a minority and hydropower is really fully at the end of the system. The power plants what uh, Netherlands has are uh, just uh, these three big ones. Alfen, and Linen and, uh, and Maurik, and then some several small ones, which are really uh, mostly below one megawatt. And if you look to the potential, the potential is approximately in the small hydropower, 12 uh, megawatts, and now built in is approximately three megawatts. And if you look uh, 2013, 2016, the capacity have not be, has mi minimally be changed. This data and the data for all other countries you can also get from the small uh, small hydropower world atlas, which you can download from the from the internet, and you get the data for approximately 150 countries around the world. Yes, what is the power and what is the energy? Energy is the capacity the capacity of doing work expressed in the in the kilowatt hours. Its output of the hydroelectric power plant is uh, is electrical energy. Power is a rate of the energy produced or used and is expressed in the kilowatts. How we can calculate uh, the, the hydropower energy? This is a potential energy, which is in reality mass of water multiplied by discharge, multiplied by head, and multiplied by efficiency factor. And if we take all efficiencies in, in the account, efficiencies in the turbine generator, transformer, power waterway, then we can say uh, this factor is approximately 8 multiplied by H multiplied by Q. If we look to the kinetic power, the physics is the same, but the formula is a little bit different. You see it here, one half of a uh, uh, rho multiplied by uh, area multiplied by uh, velo velocity of the water on the, on the third potential. And in reality, this is the same formula if you put Q for, for Q, area multiplied by velocity, and for, for H, in, real, in reality, the kinetic, H, uh, kinetic uh, head done by, by the velocity of the water. How the power, uh, powerhouse works? Simple, we have potential energy of the, of the water on some level. In the power waterway, this potential energy partly uh, transferred in the kinetic energy, and then in the turbine, in the rotational mechanical energy, and uh, in the generator, then in the electrical energy, and the water goes back to the to the river. What is the problem of the Netherlands? Why Netherlands have uh, so less uh, uh, less hydropower and so less hydropower potential? Uh, reason is very simple: there is a lot of water, but there is no head, or very low head. And uh, the main problem is. If you look to here to the different types of the turbines, they are all done for, for, for heads, for example, Pelton up to, uh, to, to 200, 300 meters, Francis and Axial uh, Kaplan turbines are working in, to the heads, to the minimal heads of two to three meters. And this is a head which is raw, we can say, uh, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Also, these small heads are raw in the Netherlands. And this is the main problem of the hydropower in the, in the Netherlands and the reason for this low, uh, low hydropower. 
The another part what we will have today is a kinetic energy. I will not go in it, but I just uh, want to make it in introduction. We will we have a channel river which is with flowing water, and we can put devices like propellers, different types, in the water, which will rotate and produce a certain amount of energy from this one. Uh, in the second block of my presentation, I will show some solutions worldwide what, with, uh, with the very low head turbines, solutions which could be also used in, in Netherlands. And then uh, I will go to the, to, the, to the solutions which we have in the, in the Netherlands, we can say. Uh, yes, the first, first type is a, a compact, a compact Kaplan turbine, uh, so-called very low head turbine. You see it here, everything is, uh, the whole Kaplan turbine and the generator are compacted in very, very compact system. We have a rotor with, uh, uh, with, the, with, the, compact, uh, with, the, with the Kaplan turbine. And at the same time, it is a starter of the is a, is a rotor of the generator and the starter of the generator around the, everything. That it's really the whole turbine is very very flat. On the top there is also trash rack with uh, with trash rack cleaning machine. Everything is put it in. The only what you need in reality from the civil work is a quadratic channel, and you can put the turbine in it. Uh, it is. It is a, a very, uh, very uh, relatively simple construction system, but as it is norm, uh, often such simple system has another, another problem that the turbine is very, very uh, economic, expensive. It's ex expensive solution because it's a very complicated solution on the, on the electromechanical part. Another type is a, is a rod turbine which is a normal Kaplan turbine, uh, we can say bulb turbine, situated in the container. And uh, it's installed, the full, the full powerhouse, you can say, is installed in one, with one crane on the, on the, on the prepared, also uh, rectangular uh, cross-section, and uh, can, be, uh, can be easily installed and easily used. It has also advantage because uh, the, t uh, the whole this container can be heaved up and then the sediment, it's also for the sediment transport uh, very good because it can, the sediment can be transferred under, under the turbine and uh, ev evacuated from the, from the upstream side. Low head turbine, uh, also another type is a dive turbine. Dive turbine is simplification of the Kaplan or the Francis turbine. It's a turbine uh, which has no, dra uh, no uh, draft tube and no uh, wicket gates and no, no, uh, not the spiral case. And in this way, it's cheaper, simpler for installation. You see, you just need a gate, trash rack with trash rack cleaning machine, and you install the turbine. And uh, in the very simple, uh, we can say, uh, civil, civil structure. And of course, it's, it's simplification of the, of the other turbines it has efficiency, which is uh, slightly lower, 75% approximately, but it can work with the heads up to the, to, for example, one meter. Because of that, it could be also interested for, for the Netherlands. Low head turbine, Archimedes screw. Archimedes screw is uh, very, very old technology and also old technology in, uh, in Netherlands. You see here the, the, the wooden uh, screw, which is in, on the Tio Delft. Uh, showing that uh, this uh, system was used as a pump in, 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 in the past, also in Netherlands. It's used still as a, as a pumping system, for example, here in Kinderdijk, the, the three, three Archimedes screws as, a, as a, uh, pumps. And uh, how it works, the water, in, in case of the, of the turbine, the water flows uh, uh, into, the, into the screw, and the screw is rotating and transporting water down and uh, giving energy to the to the system. It's slow turning uh, system, and uh, the, there is normally the the gearbox which transfer it in the much more uh, bigger rotation speed, and uh, then the generator producing energy. Uh, the system is uh, relatively simple, relatively easy in operation and maintenance. And it's also very flexible and can work for the for the discharges or can be designed for the discharges from from 100 liters to 
to approximately 15 cubic meter per second. Here some uh, figures with, with the screws installed in, on different sides. Uh, similar to the screw but different, uh, different system is a step turbine. The step turbine is in reality a uh, water wheel but not as a circular like uh, uh, elliptical or, or, or two, two half circles with, with straight line. And uh, the water is transported through the buckets from, from upstream part and the, the lower part and is giving the uh, potential energy uh, to, the, to, the, to the rotational energy of the buckets. And uh, it's connected directly to the generator and produce energy. These turbines are, for example, here installation in, in Africa. Some low head turbines in the Netherlands, two I think most known at least for me, most known as not 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 uh, originally Dutch, but, uh, but uh, working here, is a uh, screw turbines from land industry. We will also see the uh, implementation of this uh, system of the of their turbine in in one of the power plants in, in Netherlands later, and of course the Tokado is a is a uh, company which is working on the kinetic kinetic turbine in the in, in the water. <coughs> Uh, we also, uh, as IHE, were, are and were involved in some research projects, uh, and I will, uh, with with low land uh, turbines and low land development. Two most important, uh, we can say, is uh, hydro ring, maybe known to some of the uh, of, uh, of you. Uh, this was a this was a very clever system, we can say, uh, very simple rotor of the turbine. With, with opening, in the most cases, with open, open middle part that also uh, can be used as a passage for the, for the fishes or with less, less danger for, for, for fishes if, if it, they pass through the turbine in, uh, in the downstream uh, migration. And then the permanent uh, magnet on the, on the border of the rotor and uh, the starter around it. The whole turbine, in this case, uh, 2.8 meter head and uh, 5 cubic meters, is, is less than 1 meter wide. And it's a pipe. You can put it in the pipe. You see here in the testing, uh, testing site what we have done in, in Dordrecht. You see the normal steel pipe coming to the, to, to the turbine. This, is, this part is a turbine. And then uh, a draft tube and, and uh, going down. It was really surprising that the turbine, uh, in this case, it is installed above the water level. And uh, the turbine had no, there was a negative pressure, but there was no cavitation because the negative pressure was just, uh, just uh, one to uh, just um, uh, less than one meter. But uh, it, was, it was working without any cavitation problems. And uh, such turbine, this is exactly this one, with this open system, with uh, very friendly for the fish has an efficiency of approximately 40%. If, if you close it, mathematically, there, there were uh, done the, the calculations, the efficiency will come to approximately 70%. PT is only, it is, uh, the turbine is very thin, we can say, it can be installed also in the gates, in the, in the, in the sluice gates of the, uh, of the existing systems, for example. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the only problem is that uh, development management of the company had problems and then uh, the, the project was stopped and the, the company broke in reality before the first, first turbine which was produced was installed in somewhere worldwide. The another another uh, uh, type of the, of the turbine is a Ranamic turbine, uh, which is a pro uh, in reality two two uh, rotors which are rotating in the different directions and transporting water through it and on with transport of the water of course producing the rotational energy which then over the gearbox go to the generator. Uh, disadvantage of the system is that it needs two, two different, one turbine, one, one set, one unit ex uh, exists of, of, uh, of two gearboxes and the two generators, maybe possibility to connect them together, but complicated mechanical transfer and the, and the generators is in it. 
The advantage of the system is that this uh, rotor and also stator can be made of the concrete. It's a low head, there is low pressures, and it can everything can be done by concrete. And on this way, it's easy to also for the developing world it will be easy to use it because you have possibility to to export only the molds, and you don't and and you can everything produce on the site on the on the system. How you can install it? Of course, it can work as a normal. Uh, as, as a part of the via structure. It can be also put over the via structure with the uh, invert siphon and work on this in this uh, system. And the uh, advantage of the system is that it can work also as a, as a pump. Because if we put energy on, this, on, the, on the generator, it will rotate in the, in the opposite direction, direction and we will have the pump system. And this is uh, the, the idea of aeronomic is to to put it in the in the polder in the control of the polder motors and, and use it as a as a pump and the turbine and they want to have the, the test site somewhere in the middle. Now I will jump to to the next topic. This will be alternative hydropower solutions. This is another part of work what we are doing here. Uh, we are trying to find the solutions to to generate additional energy. From the existing, from the existing hydropower, uh, for, for the existing hydraulic structures, for, uh, and these solutions are attractive and lucrative because, in reality, instead of uh, uh, additional to the to the turbine, which will produce energy and will save, uh, will pay itself back, we don't need to build other structures. We don't need vias. We don't need anything. We don't have any problems with the with the with the environmental impacts because structures are existing and uh, they are not hindering and uh, endanger the main structures of the of the function where we have these possibilities in, in water infrastructure this is in municipal and uh, agricultural water systems like in drinking water supply in drinking water systems we have to pump water to to reach the distribution grid and then in mo in, in some cases we need to reduce the pressure because the pressure will be too high for the for the grid, and uh, this reduction is normally done mechanically, destroying the energy, producing heat, and why why to do it? We can do it with also with the with the turbines. Similar can be done in the sewage systems, uh, treated wastewater systems, or also in irrigation waters. Last year we have a master thesis where uh, the, in Ethiopia we we make the analysis how to install the screw turbines in the existing um, uh, irrigation channels and generate some additional energy for the for the local local people similar is by existing dams hydropower uh, and hydropower and other plants for example 50% uh, of the dams in the world are uh, done for irrigation works and this uh, this uh, water is not used for energy production it's just for irrigation and in some cases, there is a possibility. There are head differences. There are possibilities to do it. In the existing hydropower plants, especially in the Europe, with the new European uh, directives, we have, uh, or hydropower has a big problems with the reserve flow, with ecological flows, which have to be guaranteed. And of course, this is a lost, a lost energy, especially in the diversion systems. And to reduce this one, it's easy to do it if we make, uh, if we put, for example, we are not just relieving the water, we relieve this water, release this water over the, over the turbine and produce some additional energy from this. Similar is uh, with fish passage systems. It looks strange that the, uh, the, the, the fish will go through the turbine, but on the next slide I will show you the system. Uh, it is also possible. And also navigation locks and dams can be used for the energy productions because there is a head, the water must flow the, uh, from one basin to another and we can use this head to production of the, of the energy. A uh, special part of the re revening of the energy is in the industrial systems where we have uh, uh, hydraulic systems for heating for, 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 for some industrial waters, uh, pressure waters. For example, in, in, in cooling systems and or in desalination plants with high pressures, yes, we have the uh, we we have we can use this uh, pressure after the process for using it. 
Here, some examples, drinking water turbine, drinking water turbine uh, installed in the, in the pipe, rest, uh, rest water uh, turbine installed in the existing hydropower plant. Here, as I said, the screw turbine, which produce energy with the outside screw, and inside there is another screw which transport water up, and in this way also can transport the fish up. This is not the future or, or, or prototype. This is working in Austria. We have this installed in the, in the Danube, on the, on, the, on, the, on the one small Danube power plant. Here, also the Danube system with ship locks. Here, irrigation channel and energy water from the uh, used uh, energy water here pumped to producing high pressure for the industry with the generator and the backwater comes in the turbine and help generator or reduce the generator uh, uh, consumption with, with the rotation of the turbine. My last topic is in reality our site visit and the uh, implementation of the small hydropower in the Netherlands. Uh, there is a weir structure in the, on the Dommel River, which was constructed in, in the 70s. It, was a, it is a water management system, water level regulation. There is a weir structure with three gates and uh, automatic gates and uh, approximately 30 cubic meter discharge, uh, no, no, normal discharge in the, in the system. Uh, it, uh, we, uh, we install it uh, there, the, the, the turbine in the middle, uh, middle field, or we, the, the owner of the power plant, and we were helping with our research on it. And uh, in the middle field, they installed the screw turbine, and uh, we have a runoff river power system with discharge approximately 10 cubic meters. Head is variable between 1 to 1.8 meter, dependent on the discharge. And here you see the the flow duration curves on the last 30 years. And if you look, 100 cu uh, 10 cubic meters is in this area. This, is, uh, this was the design discharge. This is the construction in the middle of the uh, middle field. The foundations were done. The turbine uh, in the land industry during the production, Const uh, civil works, the, the owners, father and son, uh, in, the, in the turbine, we can say on the side, transport of the turbine to the to the site and uh, first uh, tests on the site. The turbine is uh, the the plant is connected directly to the local grid, feeds directly the the grid uh, uh, the, the consumption grid on 220 volts. Uh, installation, as I said, in the middle field is the first private project in Netherlands, which is licensed on the existing river structure. Its financed model is also the crowd the crowdfunding with 75%, with almost five, uh, 500 different people, which are now shareholders of the power plant and getting approximately 8% per year. Uh, it's on the grid from 2016, and output is 150 kilowatt. It's not a lot, it's not a huge, and uh, produce approximately slightly less than one uh, gigawatt hour per, per year. This is this is we on the on the excursion last year. Hopefully, we will have the su such nice weather also today. Okay, thank you very much. Any question? Uh, we have time for only one question, but then there is a lot long break later, and there is a lunch. So, uh, yeah, so let's, if, if there is a question now, otherwise you can urgent question now. Yes, and it's not which with... Miro. You have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, what is the efficiency of the turbine? Uh, they, they, they are different. If you look to the low, uh, the first one, uh, low head, yes. was is a, is a, a normal Kaplan turbine with efficiency approximately 90, 91%. The similar with the second one. The Steff turbine has only, I think, 6, 70, 70, 75%. And the screw turbines are also 70 to 80%, you can say. The, uh, the the dynamic is is also in the in the range of, of 60 because of, of roughness of the system and uh, the problems that this is in testing we, we cannot say it in reality how it is because these are just the tests which have been done so okay the next okay speaker. no first Miro we have a present for you Ah, <laughs> yes, not because necessary. you're so happy <laughs> as a speaker, okay. Thank you. Yes.
Thank you, Miro. Okay, and the, the next speaker is Dennis, the writer, and he will speak about an ex give us an example of kinetic hydropower in the Netherlands, AQA River. Okay, please. All right, good morning, everybody. First off, I would like to thank uh, Miroslav and Alessandra for inviting me here and for the opportunity to show off our project. product. Sorry. So, I start with a short summary and a short history of, the, of our company and our, our products. Then I'll quickly go over some general characteristics of our products and a quick overview of existing installations before we go to our main subject, the plant we're going to visit today, uh, the prototype of the Aqua River. Speak more loud. Oh, I'm not loud enough? You have oh. a microphone. You have a microphone. Can you hear me better now? <laughs> All right, so how did we start? Uh, Aqua Projects came from a, a company uh, which already had experience with uh, various uh, civil engineering things. So we already had a base of uh, potential customers like uh, water port authorities. And during these talks, we met with Johan Bakker, who is the director of innovation from uh, Waterschap Revierland. And he planted the idea in us from do not only think in the big, but also remember the small. So, and during these talks, we also um, we also found out from what do our potential customers want. We really focused on the water authorities then. And it should just be simple, no big uh, constructions. Fish safety and ecological uh, retention is paramount. And we should also use sustainable materials. Uh, we just really focused on the niche at first and that were our polder systems where there's a lot of falling water, but not a big head in general. And for that, we also uh, looked at from how are we going to achieve that? And we thought from, well, the water wheel might be uh, a good idea. We were inspired by the old ship mills, which are still in, uh, still in operation today, uh, because they last long and they're relatively simple to uh, construct. And a year later, we already had our first operational uh, product, they cost smartware. So, a short summary of our three products. The first two, the Aqua Smart Stew or the Aqua Smartware and the Aqua Box, are uh, products for uh, potential energy, so making use of falling water. And the right one is the one we're going to visit, the Aqua River, making use of kinetic energy. Uh, the Aqua Smartware is an all-in-one uh, solution for if, uh, if a whole wear has to be replaced and um, it has an integrated water wheel which allows it to uh, operate autonomously and optionally can also be equipped with various uh, things which make it smart and and if you have multiple they can also communicate with each other <coughs> uh, during the development of the smartware we also found out that there is uh, a need to just uh, well yeah, not really a need but uh, that's, um, we need something which does not require a whole replacement, but can easily be attached to something. So the Aqua Box was developed, and basically we, we just name it Plug and Play Hydropower. Uh, it can easily be attached to an attaching structure like a wear, but also at the pumping stage, for example. And the Aqua River is, uh, yeah, basically a 21st century uh, boat mill, but then floating. And then with uh, lightweight construction and better materi uh, new material designs, uh, we hope to bring the cost down so a, a cost-efficient operation is possible. So some general, oh, some general characteristics is uh, we use as much uh, recycled plastic as possible. For now, it's uh, at the constructive part. But our ambition is to switch over to uh, using, actually using the plastic soup in the future. That will require some more development, but for now we are already using uh, recycled plastics for uh, many parts. Uh, 
So fish safety is a very uh, hot item, uh, especially for uh, our customers like the water board. And it has, and our products are tested uh, according to the latest uh, norm in the Netherlands, the NAN8775 norm, uh, which is, uh, so we ensure that it's uh, fish friendly. Um, we have been approved for subsidies, uh, both investment and uh, exploitation subsidies like the SDA Plus, just like solar and wind is. Uh, yeah, easily constructed and placed. And we and uh, water management and water safety always is paramount for our products. It should never cause a blocking or, uh, yeah, that that it's uh, that it's no longer ensured. And well, the old improvement technique of the old water mills optimized and further modernized. So some examples. This is our very first one, the Equa Smart Steel in Omera. Uh, it has a very small water wheel. But it was our very first one. And we chose this situation here because it was a very difficult situation with a very low head and a very low discharge. And for us, it was all right. If it works here, it can work everywhere. So with this low discharge in the head, it has a generation of 50 to 100 watts, which is not much, of course, but um, it's a good location for us to test uh, uh, our products and, for, uh, and then refinements are made. So, so we go a bit bigger here. There are two uh, aqua box installations which has been uh, attached to the already existing weirder. Uh, it has a diameter of 45 centimeter with a flow rate of about 800 to 2000 uh, cubic meters per hour and a head of about four, uh, 45 centimeter as well. And per piece they generate about one to three kilowatt hours. And connected to it is a pumping station, we also build, which is now zero, uh, zero energy basically because of the equa box installations there. So, so yeah, here's another one, I think I'm a bit long. And this is what we just mean with uh, plug and play, attach it, but if it has to be removed, it can also be done with a day. So yeah. this one is in a pumping station, but I think we should go to the equa river now. So, this is where we're going to visit today, the pilot a uh, The width of the applied water wheel is 3 meters, and it also has a diameter, sorry, diameter of uh, 3 meters. The definite installation will have a ma installed maximum installed capacity of 150 kilowatt. For us, it is just to prove that the Aqua River works and serve as a testbed for optimization and bending. Uh, so optimization and testing, uh, but uh, we also intend to uh, deploy the pilot at various locations. Uh, so at various locations where it's also good inside, so people can just see what it is. Uh, and we hope to change the perception of hydropower a little bit because we really noticed that people think about hydropower, it's just a dam and not much else. <laughs> So yeah, in general, um, the <coughs> sorry about that. All right, so the um, sorry. So the definite installations will be in three types, as we was uh, the Acre River Seven, Ten, and Fifteen depending on the width of the water wheel uh, which is applied. Uh, it can pump itself in and out the water uh, depending on the conditions. So, um, so, so the water level to the... the uh, sorry, I'm a bit stuck. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, it can lift itself in and out of the water depending on the conditions. And it, and uh, to optimize the design, we have uh, uh, we have designed the floats there to ensure that uh, as much as water as possible is uh, being pushed towards the, the water wheel there. And we hope to achieve a velocity factor increase of 1.5 times the velocity of the surrounding water. 
and a prototype will prove that if that is uh, the case. And optionally, it can be uh, it can be equipped with various measurement systems to improve the knowledge of our uh, river system. So some possible applications will be the first of her most the it's a decentral uh, generation of uh, electricity at a profitable rate, uh, but also to generate electricity at hard to reach places, uh, for example, in developing countries where there is now where uh, at villages which is now dependent on uh, on uh, generators, for example, uh, but also to augment existing. Uh, energy solutions uh, so such as uh, water and, and solar plants if, if, uh, if it's placed nearby um, then well yeah the water always flows and the sun doesn't always shine so it could be a nice augmentation <laughs> um, but also some more specialized cases such as uh, to generate electricity for ships which are charging at uh, boat ship battery loading points So a quick run of the uh, development process. So of course it all starts with some theory, uh, but we could, we quite quickly came up with a design. And first thing we did is build a miniature one. And what we did is uh, test different kinds of floats and also the bottom plate. The bottom plate has been largely scrapped because it's, uh, it's not expected to do a velocity increase. But in the end, we tested various kinds of floods and had it confirmed, well, yeah, verified with CFDs. And this uh, design has been proved to be the most uh, optimum for the ones we tested, which came down to about a 1.5 velocity factor increase. And, well, after that was done, we, we just quite quickly also went to the building process and first we had to find a balance between the prototype, between scale, mobility and cost. So that's why our prototype is well, almost like uh, how we intend to do it, but it's smaller because we want to be able to move it around. So, yeah. So yeah, so now this, so this is our very first one of the plants, and it will be used as an optimization and test bed. Uh, this one is hand built, so after all that is done, we, we can move to a serial production, but we are also still looking at uh, locations. Uh, it's mainly an export product, but we are, we are also working in the Netherlands to, uh, see, to see where there are some locally, uh, some local areas where there are higher velocities. Uh, yeah, and get people to know about the higher power and to change the perception of it is also one of our goals with this. And it will remain where it is uh, for half a year at least, so we can have uh, a good overview of testing at quite a, a minimum velocity um, location. Uh, yeah, what's next? Finding locations with various partners, uh, particularly in Zeeland. Uh, we're also working on getting a dedicated tidal, uh, sorry, dedicated testing area, which is for uh, the tidal test center. And for high velocities, uh, we're working on a on a variable venturi bottom plate uh, because of the uh, the inlet flow. <coughs> uh, it, uh, like uh, uh, you at the outlaw, at the outflow, you will get uh, some kind of a uh, collision. And some uh, concerns were made that at higher velocities, this collision is going to happen not where it's supposed to be near the water wheel, but in front of it. So we're working on the bottom plate like that's very early development. And also early in development is the Eka Tidal, which is basically the same concept, but then uh, used for um, tidal energy. And also very early in development, we're, we're actually looking at the feasibility of it at all, and uh, yeah, because it has consequences for material use and all that. Uh, well, some pictures, this is just to see uh, how big the water wheel is. This is the roof of it. Uh, it has just been placed on top of it. So you, you see the floats over there. 
the roof and the washer wheel. It's basically four parts, which let's just be put together. This is the inflow inside of the float. And well, there's nothing wrong with uh, having some vision. <laughs> Aqua River Aqua Tidal 2.0 at Dosegelde with solar panels and <laughs> windmills attached to it. <laughs> so, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your really interesting story. Uh, do you have questions? We have some minutes for questions here. Yeah. Okay, Kuhn. All right, Dennis, uh, thank yeah. you for your presentation. Yeah. I'm uh, Kuhn from uh, Del Tars. Yeah. Um, I happened across one of your installations yeah. uh, previous week. It's the 211G uh, Equa box system yeah. at the Lifecraft. Yeah, it's uh, on the maintenance right now. So. All right, <laughs> yeah. um, it was returning, so yeah, that's, 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 that's why. <laughs> so, um, so I happened across it. What I saw is that it was, because um, that's, of course, a natural system that, yeah. you know, there's a lot of vegetation. Yeah. When they mow the vegetation, it drifts downstream until yeah. it gathers at the, mm. at the weir and perhaps clogs up your aqua box. Yeah. So is it a known problem? Is it easy to, to solve? How do you, how do you think about it? Uh, uh, right now, that was actually the problem uh, with the aqua box. Uh, we, we had tested it for uh, uh, quite a while and it went all right for a year and the large parts uh, all uh, went all right, but indeed something has... Uh, Got uh, clocked it up right now, and uh, that was being cleaned. It was the first time in a year that it happens, but yeah. <laughs> I saw another question. Yes. Uh, Eric Mayron from uh, Slow Mill. We are a wave energy uh, startup. Yep. Um, I wonder how you. Uh, is it attached to the bottom of the river? No, no, it's. Or, it, it, or is it floating? Yeah, 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 it floats and it can pump itself up and down. Uh, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it's got a balance to say it uh, like that. But how, how do you use it to prevent it from floating? Uh, there are uh, poles attached to the side, uh, stuck pile in Netherlands. Mm -hmm. uh, don't know how to translate it in English. You could easily peel them up. Yeah. yeah. Another question from Peter. Uh, my name is Peter Schrijfel from Dutch Marine Center. Um, so it's an, uh, a big achievement uh, that you made with all the prototypes. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the levelized cost of energy, uh, especially for your sluice gate systems, because you're competing with potential grid connection. Yeah. Um, is the cost of energy low enough to compete? Is the um, for the eco box? Yeah, for the eco box uh, in particular, uh, we we really need to switch to. Uh, uh, we really need to switch to serial production to uh, open up more locations to compete uh, with that because uh, right now everything is hand built, which drives up the cost. Uh, sorry, did I uh, did I understand your question correctly? I think so. All right, <laughs> yeah, because I started talking. Um, so right now uh, we are in the building at locations which uh, uh, w uh, where we can compete uh, with it. Uh, but that's uh, still a location with either a lot of water or with, uh, with quite a high head uh, difference. And uh, basically, we have to drop all the extras to make it uh, co uh, compatible. Uh, sorry, compatible. <coughs> compatible. Thank you. Are you? Ah, okay. Well, there are many questions. So. Okay, yes, Maybe you are the first the one. Efficiency one. figures for the river. Uh, for now, uh, that will be uh, 25 to 30 percent uh, because that's an undershot uh, water wheel. And for the uh, for the ones using potential energy, that is uh, the 60 and 80 percent of the uh, what's in the water. Undershot water wheels are by nature less efficient, and we're looking if we can improve that. Uh, there was a, a last question, and yes, and then you will have to discuss. Uh, yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, Adam Candy from Tiny Dell. I've got a uh, question about the Eku Tidal, which looks really exciting. Yeah. You also mentioned uh, kind of having remote charging stations for ships, maybe in the future, in future vision. Yeah. Do you see these, these kind of small projects being deployed further from the coast, like out at sea? And so um, how do you mount them? Like, it's, it's, them? it's for now we. Uh, uh, when we're uh, going around and uh, doing uh, checks for feasibility, feasibility, we have been 
focusing on the inward uh, water uh, on uh, the Oosterschelde and the Westerschelde in particular. Um, yeah, I don't. I uh, I'm not sure if we're going outside of the course. Uh, that's maybe another <laughs> subject. Uh, <laughs> how would they be attached? Do they need to be attached to the to the sea bed? Um, no, they will be uh, floating. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we have to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, it's not presented for you. Thank right. you very much for your presentation. We have now the next speaker. Is Herman Mondale, and we'll speak about uh, Sierra Leone and applications in Sierra Leone. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Herman Mondel. I'm head of the water management department of Witveen & Bos, an engineering consultant company. Um, so we are not producing uh, hydropower but, um, or making products, but we are trying to apply these in projects, we design it or we do feasibility studies. One of the projects uh, we did was a small hydropower feasibility study in Sierra Leone. And I will highlight some components of the project. One is the hydropower assessment tool we developed with TU Delft to assess potential locations for hydropower. Um, some parts of the feasibility study, uh, selection of turbines. There was already some discussion about head and uh, flow or kinetic uh, turbines. And some conclusions, the lessons we learned for Sierra Leone. A uh, small background of the project. Uh, the climate, there's a lot of rain, but it's mainly falling in the, the wet season and in the dry season, the rivers fall nearly dry, which is challenging for hydropower. Um, we aimed for run of the river scheme, so no large reservoirs. Um, and our client is Riverblade, a Dutch Sierra Leonean uh, company, and um, they have to sell the idea, or they have to look for investors. So they are aiming for a feasible um, <coughs> um, scheme. And there was already some discussion about. The, the tariff or the cost for producing energy. That's an important component in it. Um, yeah, this tool we developed with the TU Delft. There's an article published in the uh, PLOS magazine about it. It's a GIS tool. We use global available data of the DEM and um, runoff river data. Uh, the dam is used to determine the location of rivers. The catchments and uh, combined with the river flow data, we can determine the discharge in rivers and combined with the uh, difference in surface level, we have a head and combined it provides um, the potential power production for every grid cell in the river. Um, and we determined the the potential power production in the world, including this is a picture of Africa. You see the picture of Sierra Leone. Uh, but this is based on very rough data. So for Sierra Leone, we adjusted uh, or calibrated this model. We found out that the discharges calculated in the dry season were much too low. So based on available data and measurements, which was not too much, um, we, we adjusted the model and uh, had some quite good results, as you can see in the picture on the top. Uh, at the end of the project, we found out a, a large discharge measurement for the Bumbuna Dam, which is located in the center of the country for an 80 years period. And we found out that our model was quite accurate. Um, and we also went into the field on the locations where we predicted good hydropower locations and those who, indeed there were waterfalls um, or rapids. So I think this tool is quite good to, on a very rough or global scale, determine hydropower locations. Uh, this is the result. Um, I will not 
go into much detail because I think our client does not like it if I provide you all the information. Uh, oh, but one thing, uh, the total small hydro power capacity for Sierra Leone is 90 megawatt, which will more or less um, will double the current capacity in the country. Um, we conducted a first a pre-visibility study for around 10 or 20 locations, which we found were potentially good. Um, an important aspect to that is um, uh, the connection to the grid. In Sierra Leone, there are only two main power lines available. Um, so you have to be lucky to be in the vicinity of, of the grid. Um, and if you have to go further away than around five kilometers, it's too expensive to develop the grid. Um, so the grid or a large um, um, industry for the demand has to be within five or let's say maximum 10 kilometers, which is in Sierra Leone a very limiting um, uh, uh, aspect. Furthermore, we did conduct in Asia because it's a run of the river scheme. Um, the impact is limited. Um, we want to apply some weirs to increase the head to make it more efficient. So you have uh, an increase of flooding and we can mitigate that with some dikes to prevent too much flooding. Other important aspects is that the river is used for transportation uh, with small boats fishing and sand mining, but the impact to that is limited. Um, accessibility is an important aspect. You have to be able to reach um, the location easily. Um, and of course, the cost estimate to make the plant and, to, and the amount of energy you can produce is quite important uh, in this case for the client, because it has to be financially feasible to have a case. Um, yeah, we looked at um, different types of turbines. Miroslav already explained about it. We looked at head-based ones, but there was also a strong demand to look at. Um, yeah, these these are like Kaplan void. Uh, we also looked at a very low head turbine, but there was also a large demand um, to look at the flow-based turbines, especially the Orion water mill. Um, uh, in this case, we could not, it was not very feasible to ply them. Uh, also like the Tocardo one, uh, important aspect is that the efficiency is quite low. If you, um, the maximum, with kinetic energy, the maximum efficiency you can reach for most of the flow based ones is around 50%, because mathematically, or the, yeah, that's the maximum you can reach, but most are lower than that. I think, Dennis, also your product is about 30%. Uh, and also, if you look at the Tocardo one, it's only a round um, uh, area in which you can generate energy with a large river. So it's difficult to catch all the capacity of the river within um, the turbine. The second thing is that the flow velocity, if you look at um, uh, the formula, the, the flow velocity is to the power 3. So you want to have um, a high flow velocity as possible. Uh, in this case, the flow velocity was too low. So you want to um, increase the flow velocity to, to guide the, the river to a small location. But then you need a lot of civil structures, which makes it more expensive. And if you already make civil structures, then it's more efficient to apply uh, head-based uh, turbines in most cases. I think we've, um, it can be very suitable for remote locations um, where you have a small grid to develop uh, electricity to households. But then, uh, well, in Africa, you have a large competition with solar power, which is probably is in most cases cheaper and easier for maintenance. So it's uh, in Sierra Leone at least challenging to apply um, flow-based hydropower. 
Um, and also important aspect in here for investors is um, availability of spare parts. At some producers, spare parts are not on stock. So if something is broken, you have to wait half a month. But that is not for all uh, producers, probably. But also the risk of companies being bankrupt after five years. They have to survive all the startups. So that's, um, I think, challenging for all the startups and companies uh, uh, who evolved recently. Um, to be part of bigger projects around the world. Um, we conducted a feasibility study. We did a topographical survey with drones. Uh, we did hydraulic impact modeling because we use weirs, so we have an impact on uh, flooding. Um, and we made a calculation of the power you can generate throughout the year. And you see in the, um, in the wet season, when the discharge, the blue line is high, uh, the head is lower because downstream the water level becomes higher and upstream of the weir the water level remains more or less the same. It's a little bit higher but not much higher as downstream. And you also see in the, in the dry season that the river discharge becomes very low. Um, so the power production in those months is limited. Uh, we designed uh, the civil structure, so the weir, um, the power plant, the turbine, and determined the feasibility. So the cost for uh, the construction, operation, and maintenance, and also based on the power you can produce every year, uh, if it's feasible or not. Uh, for some locations, it's um, it can be feasible, but also depends on the um, the cost for financing. Investors uh, wants to have a high uh, rate on investment because of the risk of investing in countries like Sierra Leone. Uh, we just had elections, but you don't know what the government will do within a couple of years. Um, so it's a risky country. So in a country where electricity is really needed, investors wants to have a high profit because of the risk. Um, and now I come to the conclusions. Um, yeah, what I said uh, at the end, power development in, I thought if there's uh, hardly any energy like in Sierra Leone, where I think only five to 10% of the people has access to energy, it's very challenging to increase that situation or to improve the situation because there's no grid available. Um, in this case, it's a high risk country. So investors are not um, very interested to invest in such countries um, and so it's difficult also if you produce your power to get yeah to sell it to the grid or to customers uh, in Sierra Leone yeah the highest head available is in the mountains but there the discharge is low or zero in the dry season and um, there are less people living in the mountains and uh, there's less industry so you cannot uh, sell your energy and then you have to go to the delta, uh, the lower lying areas where the head is less. So that's also challenging. Um, yeah, the risk in investment I already explained. Um, yeah, and the competition be between the flow based, the kinetic energy based hydropower against the use of solar energy in Africa or other countries with a lot of sun. Um, only what could be a good option is there's uh, maybe also applicable for other countries. There's one large reservoir in Sierra Leone and that also provides a more uh, stable flow throughout the year. So also in the dry season there's a higher discharge than in other rivers. So those could be more uh, feasible, um, a more feasible river to uh, play. Yeah, to make more uh, hydropower uh, plants. This is the end of the presentation. I don't know if there are some questions. Many, okay. Uh, I saw first Alessandro, then uh, I go to the others. Ale Where we have the microphone? Uh, the microphone, but well, maybe you can try to shout. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for the presentation. Let me just tell you if you could please a little bit more detail on the hydrological model uh, underlying these uh, hydro assessment tools. Uh, it's this one, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we start with the digital elevation model. So then we have the elevation of every grid cell. Uh, with GIS, you can determine uh, the flow direction. And based on that, you can uh, determine the location of rivers, which you see on the, on the right. Um, and if you have the rivers, you also can determine the catchment area of it. So the area discharging to it. Um, and there is the GRDC runoff data set provides data uh, for rivers and you can confer that to let's say river discharge per grid cell. So if you know the catchment area, you confer that to a discharge of that uh, catchment in that river. Um, and because of the, with the dam, you also can determine the head between two grid cells. So it's based that, on the data set that is uh, globally available? Yes. At monthly time scale? Or? This is monthly time scale, yes. But you see that the, the GRDC runoff data set is um, <laughs> yeah, not very accurate. It gives a rough ID, but like in the dry season, uh, it predicts no, no or very low discharge. And in fact, there's more discharge. Um, and also found in Indonesia the opposite. So it's, it gives a very rough ID, but if like in this case, you have to calibrate the model to have more accurate figures. No, no, no. Now then we use the, the <coughs> available measurements okay. of this charge. Okay, we're going anti-clock. So you and then you and then Yes, uh, yes. I'm Charles Jeff, the uh, chef course participant. Apart from the member of the company, I'm going to share some of the information. Just to follow up to this question, uh, can you know the name of the software that we use, and is it an open source software? <coughs> it's just developed in GIS. Um, the whole database set is um, can be reached through TU Delft. Um, I don't know exactly how and where, but. Um, I can find it out for you, but it, it should be open source and should be available. Other question there? Yes. Good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. My name is Lana from Google Island in Sri Lanka. Um, I have a question about the 90 megawatts. You said there was 90 megawatts of small power hydro potential. And I was curious how you were defining small hydro, how large, in terms of capacity. And it sounded like it was all low hanging fruit. Could you clarify the size of the plants and the definition and whether that was low hydro or high? It sounded like the higher part was quite easy. Uh, I think all locations were, I think, maximum of 10 megawatts. But that's in the wet season, so in low season it's lower. Um, and minimum of around 3 megawatt. And also uh, the head should be around 2 or 3 meter to make it feasible. Uh, so none of the high-end projects that you identified are feasible because of the No, there are some more high-head um, locations. There are already some Chinese investors were chasing yeah. those. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, uh, maybe the, the, the best locations are already, let's say, sold out. Uh, so we were, our river blade was aiming of the location more under the radar. Uh, okay. Another question here? Throw it, throw it. Throw it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's done on this way. Throw it. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's done for this. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, yeah. Uh, <laughs> There's the pro. My name is Maximo Periana and I'm working at Rousseau Center Milano. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. The, the first one is the, the I, I saw that they, they are, let's say, mountainous areas, let's say. So my suggestion is that the monthly data is quite rough, you know, 
to define the potential the same. So if if you could if you could have some green for daily data, but I I first I can I give you congratulations to work in this country because I understand the difficulties of over there. But if there is some kind of daily rainfall, you can get maybe some better estimations of daily discharge, as they say, because it can be varied yeah. by a lot between one day and another when the month comes. Okay, this is one thing. The second question is uh, if you have tried, it is very interesting in this tool, so it would be close to working on this kind of, of analysis, but can you try to pick up the water somewhere and then to provide in another place in order to gain heat from deriving water in the upstream part and turbine, you know, through the derivation channel, then to, to, uh, to let's say, to a uh, small reservoir and then to the paint stock in order to gain uh, water, uh, let's say, head in the same discharge. I, I understand that it is difficult because it's a forest to go there. <laughs> then to win to one channel and to maintain the be is difficult, but you know, you, you gain a lot on, on, on power. This is a question. I don't know, I don't no, know if, if, if it is possible or not. In our, um, we designed some weirs to increase that. I'm not sure if i answering your question well. Uh, we applied some weirs to increase the head because otherwise it's not uh, feasible. And uh, one shortcoming of this model, um, in the mountains you can have a shortcut. Um, if the river is very bending, you could make a shortcut, have a larger head with uh, yeah, a small, um, a small river. Um, and that's not coming out of this model. So visually we checked, could that be feasible? Um, but that was not feasible in this case. But it's a shortcoming of this model, indeed. Okay, we have to stop here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, but... Oh. If it is short. Yes. Okay. In short, many words, uh, projects. Uh, thank you for the presentation, very interesting. Uh, one question, you were referring to um, uh, civil uh, infrastructure costs on the, uh, the, the head-based systems and the fact that the flow-based system needs to have larger infrastructure civil costs. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, no, I don't say it has more civil structure costs than head-based, but I think that the advantage of the flow-based one should be that, uh, as Dennis also said, you just put it in an existing irrigation channel or put it under a bridge. Um, but we ask, for example, Orion to uh, make a proposal and they incorporate also uh, a dam to guide the water to the turbine to have a higher flow velocity. And then if you have to make a dam, that's already 50% uh, of the total cost. Um, and then if you make a dam, then a head-based turbine has more higher, yeah, two times or three times higher efficiency. And then that becomes more feasible. So that's the, um, uh, yeah, that's your challenge, how to, generate most kinetic energy. But maybe in other rivers with higher flow velocities, it could be, um, if you don't need civil structures, I think it could be feasible. Thank you for your uh, yeah. Thank you for your tools to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, we have the next speaker, is Jorn Bayen. And he will speak about the flexible operation of lowland hydropower. Thank you. Um, I was late today, so I didn't have the chance to put my presentation on a USB stick. Yeah. Can I connect my laptop to okay. the beaver? Yeah, yeah, it's just one. 
Do we need to solve? Uh, solve? I, see, I speak it here. Is it the right one? Oh, no, it's the one connected to the second. Ah, yes. This was the problem. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is uh, Ezra Baia. I, um, I work for uh, uh, Pistos. Um, Pistos is a, uh, a global software solution provider for the energy and water industries. Uh, so we do a substantial amount of work for the hydropower industry. Um, today, I will be speaking about um, opportunities for flexible operation of low head hydropower plants. Um, if you look at a typical um, segmented river with weirs, like for example the Meuse in the Netherlands, you will find that often the agency in charge, uh, at if you look at the Meuse, um, operates the river reaches with, um, well, with, with essentially with a minimum and a maximum water level, trying to maintain the actual water level between those targets. So that leaves a certain amount of, of operational flexibility. Um, and the question we um, try to answer in this study is um, whether this flexibility between min and max can be exploited for hydropower operations. Um, in particular, can it be used to time generation of hydropower with fluctuations in the energy spot price. Because if you could do that, you would um, be able to increase the, uh, the, the, the function of the existing hydropower plants within the, the green economy. Um, and if you can do that, what would we gain in terms of energy generated, in terms of revenue, uh, and also in terms of CO2 Production by uh, if you're able to operate your hydropower plant, say when there is no wind and no sun, uh, just to sketch a situation, then uh, you would be able to offset CO2 produced by, say, a gas power plant. Um, and, well, perhaps most importantly, can this be done without harming the ecology of the river? Um, so we, we decided to, to tackle this question um, with a, a case study, namely the hydropower plant at Linne on the, the Meuse. Um, it was a collaboration between uh, Kisters and Julia Rau from the Fachhochschule Aachen in Germany, uh, Deltaris, Matthijs and Tom and Bernd Becker who are here today, and uh, my colleague uh, Jesse van der Wees from Canada who is uh, on the back of uh, um, all right, so let's, let's get to it. Uh, first of all, where is this power plant? Um, well, it's on, on the most, so it's just, just south of, uh, of Roermond. Um, it's a bit of a funny area. There's been uh, lots of extraction of gravel and sand here. So we have all these, these lake-like things around, around the river. A bit of a mess if you look on the map. Um, but the, uh, the plant is... Um, is indicated here with the, the brown red bar. Um, so it's just before the, the bend in the in the river. So here's a uh, sunlight photo. You can see the power plant right there. Um, so to answer this question, we need to consider at least two reaches of the river. So we need to look at the reach upstream from the power plant. Um, so this is, this is a, a reach with a surface area of about 12 million uh, uh, square meters. 
um, and the, the operation of water levels maintained by Rex Waterstaat uh, are uh, uh, 20,8 meters above sea level uh, up to uh, 21.15. So that leaves about 35 centimeters of potential flex that might be exploited. So we'll see later on if that's possible or not. Um, downstream, we also need to consider the, uh, the reach downstream. Um, we don't want to disturb the dynamics there too much. And we also need to make sure that whatever we put into that reach um, can be taken further downstream because as we'll see later on, the capacity of the, um, the, the stony part of the weir uh, at Hormont is less than that of the turbines and weir at Linna. So it, it's somehow a bottleneck in the system. So we need to take this into account. Again, some flexion at the level, about 25 centimeters in this case, and you already see that there is a head difference of about four meters here. So if we look at the, the, the turbines at Linne, there are four uh, Kaplan turbines from, from 89, I think they were, they were installed. Um, uh, here you see the uh, efficiency uh, diagram of the hard to read but different blade angles. So it's, it's a variable fish, Kaplan turbine, four of them. Um, the total uh, rated capacity of the plant is, uh, is 14 uh, megawatts. Um, based on some uh, some uh, some preliminary SOMAC simulations uh, created by, by Matthijs, Matthijs, we try to understand the relation between the, the discharge from over the weirs and, and through the turbines at Linne and the, the, the the tail race, the, the increase of water level just behind, the, just downstream of the weir. Um, we tried a few simulations, but we, we get this suspiciously linear relation out. So we, we definitely need to revisit this if, if, if we ever move, move into practice with this. But in any case, the, the message is um, the more you discharge through the complex, um, the higher locally your water level, of course, uh, which again reduces your efficiency, it reduces the head locally. That's an important effect to take into account. Um, so this is a this is a photograph of the situation in Linus. So you have to imagine the, the, the turbines are, are here, and then there are the, the, the weir consisting of two parts. There is a computer controlled. Uh, there are three computer computer controlled gates, the stony part, and there is a, a fixed part of the weir which requires manual intervention for the, the settings to be changed. Um, so in flexible operation, we essentially only want to, 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 to play with the turbines and the, the three gates. Um, downstream at Ramon, there's a similar situation, just two computer controlled gates in this case with a combined capacity uh, of, 200, of, of 200 cube per second, which is less than that of the Smithsonian's at, at, at Linna. So that's the, the bottleneck I mentioned. There are also fish ladders at both sides. Um, an issue here on the, 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 the Meuse, as everywhere else, is, is, is fish. Uh, I mean, uh, we're not the only users of river water. Um, and especially Kaplan turbines have the uh, unpleasant property of tending to shred fish. Um, so uh, we obviously want to avoid that as much as we can. So. The way this is, uh, this is this is being developed in the Meuse now is um, is with with a micromat. It's a it's, it's a it's a detection device um, where uh, eel are essentially trapped for a period of time, uh, and if they start to to show increased movement, it's 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 a signal that a migration event is coming on. And when that happens, uh, basically a button is pressed and, and and all the water is diverted from the turbines to the weirs. Um, so that's, that's the strategy of, of handling fish mortality, at least during fish migration periods. Um, another constraining factor at Linne is the, the presence of a, a large traditional um, power plant. Well, traditional, it's, it's actually a, a very nice piece of hardware, or a modern uh, gas-fired power plant, which is able to scale up and down in response to the needs of the energy market. However, uh, we have too many of these right now, and this, this thing has been mothballed, so it's, it's not in use. 
However, uh, it could be put back in use um, um, with, with a couple of days' notice, and in that case, it will need cooling water. And if it does make use of the cooling water, um, it will well, warm up the water locally uh, behind the weir at Linne, um, which, uh, uh, which would pose some constraints on, on uh, the amount of buffering uh, that can be done uh, at the weir. We didn't look at this in further detail uh, because the plant is mothballed, it hasn't been used for years, but this is something that needs to be kept in mind as a, as a constraining factor. Um, coming to the, the, the pewter model of, of how we, we, we try to assess the flex here, um, so we modeled the two river sections I described um, um, with the, the, the structure separating the two, um, and uh, we used uh, an open source software package, uh, RTC tools, um, which is uh, to originally created at Deltaris, but these days is a, is a joint Deltaris Kisters project. Um, we use RTC tools here to perform um, optimal control of this computer model um, to get an idea of um, what optimal operation of the system looks like. Uh, but defining optimal operation is a, is a is a challenge in itself because. I mean, of course, we, if, we, if we just start to maximize for revenue from the, the power company's point of view, well, it's easy, you know, you just you start hydro peaking, sending large waves down the river, causing all sorts of ecological trouble downstream. Um, so the way where, where things are right now is that, so we have a couple of, of, of constraints of, of operational goals for the optimization. Um, ordered according to priority. So what the optimization will, will do is it will first of all, before doing anything else, it will constrain the system so that the water levels um, at the water level uh, will stick between the, the, the min and max provided by, by Lex Waterstaat. Um, so it will first do that, that constrains the, the, the options available. Um, once it's done that, within the remaining flexibility, it will, it will start damping fluctuations in the outflow from the linear complex, so as not to exceed fluctuations in the, in the inflow. Uh, and you can even obviously add damping here so that, that, that flow fluctuations are dampened out uh, by this optimization. Um, this again further constrains the flex avail available, and finally, within any flex set, might still be available, we maximize revenue for the power company, uh, which shifts generation to moments of high energy spot prices. And the assumption is low wind and solar availability. Um, yeah, some, some boundary conditions, but let me, let me go to the, the results. So this is a reference case. It's, it's, a, it's a rather static case, but designed to, to highlight the impact of the, the optimization. Um, so what we have here is, is, a, is, a, is some historical discharge data for a week in April this year, um, measured at, at Borghaire, uh, further south on the Meuse. Um, and the complex here just tries to maintain the, the strafe pile, uh, the, the, the preferred water level within the min and the max as expressed by the Rijkswaterstaat. Um, and of course, if you use optimization, it can do that perfectly simply by passing exactly the same flow that comes in out through the complex. Um, so if you do this, this kind of pass-through operation, uh, you get about, uh, in this scenario, 540 megawatt hours of energy during a week, um, which with the, the energy spot price is worth about uh, 20,000 euros. Now let's make it a bit more interesting. Let's look at the optimization uh, subject to the, the prioritized goals uh, I, I explained. Um, so what we're seeing now is, um, first of all, if we look at the bottom plot, since we, since we, um, we, we, we dropped the requirement to stay exactly on the target water level when we stay within min and max, the optimization will generally try to drive the um, the water levels upstream and downstream apart so as to, to maximize hydraulic head. 
So that's one effect you see. It doesn't always do that. So you see some fluctuations in the water level. And these are caused by the, the, the timing of discharges to, um, to, to, to follow the, the, uh, the, the energy price signal. So the, the spot price signal is the, the, the dotted line in the, 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 the top graph. And the, the red line is as before, is exactly the same inflow signal. And the blue line now is the total outflow from the, the, the linear complex. Um, and um, well, what you see here is that uh, it starts to produce a lot when the price is high. Then when the price is low, it, it stops producing for a while, buffering up a little bit um, until the price is, is, is good again, it then starts producing. Um, but all we, we do this while at the same time reducing the inflow fluctuations. And so we are, we're playing into the energy price while actually making the river dynamics more stable which is generally understood to benefit the river ecology. Um, so um, I heard the, 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 the word treasure, ch treasure chest or tre treasure trove earlier, and I think we've, we, we have one here. Um, it's possible to generate with this kind of optimization, with, an exi with existing low head hydro hardware, um, for a particular scenario, 75% 75 more, 75 more energy, 77% more revenue while at the same time improving the the the, the, uh, the well, reducing fluctuations and thereby um, benefiting the uh, the river ecology so um, huge amount of extra power huge amount of extra revenue and um, improved ecology thank you we actually have only one minute uh, for questions, and then we have a long break when you can also ask your questions. Is there anybody with a quick, quick one? Okay, you. Um, thank you for uh, the very interesting uh, uh, story. Um, you, the, the last one, the, the, the previous sheet, yes. In the bottom, I see the, the level control, which is very stable, as you uh, mentioned. Does it mean that you both controlled the uh, the linear and the horizontal uh, width? Yeah, you have to control them. Uh, well, you can stand them. Okay. Now we have a half an hour break. Okay, put it there. Okay. <laughs> we start uh, again because we want to be on schema. As it was very good this morning, I think you can make it also this morning, this first part. You can make the same in the second part. The next speaker is Peter Steinfrom and, uh, from the Dutch Marine Energy, and he will introduce the marine parts. So far we were dealing mostly with rivers, and now we deal with the sea. Thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Um, my name is Peter Schijfond uh, from Dutch Marine Energy Center. We're based in Alkmaar and we have a test facility in the north of Holland. Um, and I would like to share with you um, some status update of different technologies related to tidal, wave, and also a short bit on OTEC and salinity gradient. And these are typically the subjects that we cover on the marine energy and that uh, DMEC has specialized in. Um, so I'll give you a background of what DMEC does. Um, I will try to introduce to you four sort of concepts of solutions where we can integrate all these technologies. Uh, and then zoom in on tidal energy technologies around the world, focusing on tidal stream, wave energy technologies, and briefly OTEC and salinity. My own background, I'm an engineer. I graduated from Glasgow University. Um, I studied there for seven years, and that's where I actually got inspired by marine energy. Uh, there was the early um, uh, inventors of uh, the, the, the wave energy system of uh, Stephen Salter, um, and that helped me to uh, set up uh, an invention called the wave rotor. And that was tested uh, in Glasgow and in different other test laboratories, and eventually uh, this prototype that was installed in the Westerschelde a five by five meter diameter turbine, which can um, rotate both in the tides, but can also tap the energy from the waves. 
and then it was sold off to uh, ESC Meerwede, I think in 2011 or 2012. And I started my own company. And through there, I uh, supported Blue Water Energy Services with the development of the Blue Tech device, um, Tocardo and DMEC. Um, I also assisted in the early phases of the Brouwers Dam project um, and support uh, government and the EU uh, on different strategic studies. We have a, an association in the Netherlands called uh, EWA, the Energy from Water Association. It's a branch organization with about 25 members. Um, and if you are not yet a member, then we warmly invite you to join. Um, it's a good network organization and we try to influence uh, policy in the Netherlands. I'm also um, chair for the ICTC114, which is a, a committee that develops standards for marine energy. And there's an ICRE set of uh, which does certification. And it's a very important phase at this moment because I think we've heard from uh, different speakers um, the reliability uh, and investor confidence uh, is something that we have to work on. Uh, investor confidence uh, comes when technology um, can be verified independently, both in terms of its reliability but also in terms of its performance. Um, so once we have a certification scheme in place, we can actually help developers to uh, go through sort of state gauges of certification and build up this confidence. And for each step of confidence, issue conformity statements, which can then help um, investors to uh, release maybe the next round of funding. So Dutch Marine Energy Center has its uh, uh, offices in Den Oever, but also in Alkmaar, where there is a site uh, where Tocardo has actually um, uh, installed a number of turbines already for a few years. Uh, and they are actually our launching customer. And this is something you see for test centers all around the world. You need a launching customer to, uh, to, to set up your, your test facilities. Um, there's also been a test facility just south of the island of Tessel, which is an offshore site, uh, a site of about 200 meters wide and 400 meters long, with four mooring points, and Bluetech was tested there in 2015. This is just a brief video of the installation of the three Tocardo turbines. I just think it's interesting to see the, the size of it. Uh, these are 100 kilowatt turbines. Uh, they were shown in a previous presentation. Uh, in the case of sluice gates, it means that the water is only flowing in one direction, and that is discharging. Discharging from the IJsselmeer into the Waddenzee. So they are single directional turbines. Um, in the case of the Oosterschelde, which Miro will present more on, it's a bi-directional turbine and the blades can actually flip around its own axis, 180 degrees, in order to handle the flow in two directions. They can be swiveled out of the water. You see here a very large steel structure, maybe it's slightly over-designed, but this was like a, a sort of finger exercise for the larger installation, the Oosterschelde, which had to handle five turbines and also be swiveled out of the water. Um, I will put this music a little bit down if I can, but maybe I cannot. Um, here you see the installation of the floating platform of Bluetech. Uh, it is in the size of a container unit and it can handle different types of turbines and once it's in the water the, the fore and the aft are installed with pins. It's yellow and it's sort of uh, easy assembled. It looks a little bit like an IKEA product. Uh, it was tested for I think nearly a year um, at the site of Tesla and then it was moved to EMEC, the European Marine Energy Center on Orkney. So important uh, innovations here is the mooring system um, and uh, access for inspection. 80% of your uh, um, um, offshore maintenance costs are related to just inspection, not even repair. So that 80%, if you're doing that underwater, you're talking about costs of 100 times of the same kind of maintenance cost in the net, uh, on land. So you really have to make sure you minimize that cost. One way of doing it is making sure that everything is accessible for inspection above the water level. Then still, it's 10 times more expensive than a land inspection. The challenge here also was certification. How do you, how do you qualify a technology 
that is so innovative, that has so many new elements. So that's why we need new standards, technology qualification, in order to assess the reliability with a third party uh, uh, method. That's called technology qualification. Very important first step in uh, new technologies. I can recommend everyone. So DMAC is involved in a number of uh, EU funded projects. Uh, this is the uh, Four Seas project, the Mayanac project and the MET certified project. And we've recently launched a project called MEA, Marine Energy Alliance, where we're going to help 40 SMEs to uh, get access to support of engineers and consultants to uh, move the technology a step further. We have international partnerships with Portugal, with EMEC and with Japan. Um, and we cooperate with technology developers and test centers uh, around the world. Um, but I want to uh, just zoom out these four concepts or solutions. It's not just about the technology, it is about the application where the uh, environment, which is going to determine the business case. So first of all, we've seen already some dam solutions. We would call it energizing deltas or sustainable deltas. Uh, we have a very strong reputation uh, around the world of our knowledge of dams. And uh, it is uh, more and more a feasible solution to start integrating uh, marine energy solutions in a dam. And this is something we can uh, market uh, worldwide as an export product. Uh, there's a concept called Tidal Bridge, developed uh, by Tidal Bridge Company, together with BAM at the moment uh, for Indonesia. There you have an existing infrastructure or an uh, infrastructure that needs to be built, but that is going to provide uh, uh, the support for uh, your turbines. And then you can actually finance the whole project um, at much lower cost because you're building an infrastructure project. And that is something I'm also going to hint on later, is the cost uh, of money actually determines very much whether your business case is going to work in the early phases. We've already heard from the Sierra Leone project, the higher the risk, the higher the return, and the more difficult your business case is going to be. Self-sustaining islands, uh, especially in Asia, there's thousands and thousands of islands that have very high cost of energy because of imported fuels, and they're looking at sustainability or self-sustainability and uh, marine energy is uh, an ideal solution for it because it's all around the waves, the tides and the temperatures. And then coastal renewal. Coastal renewal, looking at harbors and breakwater systems. Those are a clear market where you can integrate your technologies. Practical forecast. Um, globally, uh, some predict 300 gigawatts of, uh, by 2050. Uh, that's a huge figure because at the moment we are still at a very low figure. Um, but the emission is there and uh, it's an aggregated amount from the different technologies. Development phases, if we look at those four technologies, I would say uh, salinity gradient is still in the R&D phase, although we are seeing real life scale pilots. OTEC uh, is slowly moving towards large scale pilots in prototyping. Uh, wave energy, um, there is no dominant design yet. So we're still in a demonstration phase. Tidal, you see pre-commercial uh, uh, projects, but I would state that at the moment, Tidal NG is not yet commercial, unless you're looking at very high barrage, uh, high head barrage systems. So I will zoom in uh, to uh, Tidal Stream worldwide. The main thing to notice here is that the, the dots are everywhere. Basically, uh, it is a very diffuse market and it depends very much on geographical conditions. And that's different for OTEC and for WAVE. Zooming into the Netherlands, we see that um, uh, this is uh, the, the tidal of the, the, the North Sea Basin with the tidal movement. And you see that there's very high um, uh, tidal range uh, around uh, the Channel Islands. Uh, but also some considerable uh, tidal range in the province of Zeeland. Uh, in the Westerschelde it's 5 meters and it reduces quite quickly to the Brouwersdam to about 2 meters. The Brouwersdam, there is a plan for it to open it in order to improve the water quality of the Gevelingen Lake. There is going to be a market consultation in November to gauge industry's interest in actually realizing a tidal power station in that dam. 
they need an opening of about 100 meters. So once you open a dam for 100 meters, you can get very high velocities, maybe five meters per second. Um, so that's a huge energy flux. A little bit further infield, there's a project here by Menno Boers also, PT Projects, uh, developing a tidal technology center in the Geveningen Dam. And that's going to give access to um, technologies to um, basically be attached to an opening in a siphon. Uh, and it's going to be there, well, at the moment you're already building uh, the, the, the channels. Um, and um, hopefully next year the first turbines will be in the water. Um, so that's typically a, a low head hydro uh, situation. Um, just to show a video of more free stream movement, what are we talking about? We're talking about high velocities, what I said, five meters per second. That's a good case. Three meters per second is also good. Two and a half meters, mm, yeah, it is very fast, but it's already on the bottom line of what is really interesting for a business case. And below two meters, I would say there's no business case. So you need very, very high velocities. And we've seen it and heard it before, uh, power is proportional to the velocity cubed. That means that every single drop in your cubed is going to have an eight-fold drop in your power. So it is very sensitive to that velocity. You really need to be in the best sites. So I believe tidal stream uh, has a market, but it is a niche market and it will always remain a niche market. And you have to pinpoint the places in the world literally with a pin. Because even within a straight, you can be 10 meters out to get your optimum position. Classification of different free stream turbines. Um, there's drag devices and there's lift devices. And then within the category of drag, drag we can look at a water wheel and at the Archimedes screw. Lifting devices are typically a horizontal axis turbine, a vertical axis turbine, or something that is translating. I'm going to show you some examples. We've heard it and seen it before in the project for Sierra Leone, uh, uh, the slow, uh, sorry, I'm saying slow mill, uh, the Orion mill, uh, Dolph Passman is here from uh, Orion mill. Um, it is a, a duct with a, a turbine with a vertical axis with flaps uh, and the flaps are being pushed uh, by the water uh, and on the upward stroke, they're actually being protected by part of the shell so that they have less resistance. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, it is a drag device, um, uh, like the other devices that look different, but we've seen them as well, the, the, the helical screws and the Archimedes screw. They have some limitations, um, uh, a, a relatively low efficiency if you compare to uh, a lift device uh, in the range of 10, 25, and maybe 30%. Uh, they have low rotational speeds, they don't move much faster than the speed of the water. Um, and they're relatively heavy because you need a lot of material to keep it in place, but also to harness this drag. But there's also clear advantages. Um, they're very simple and very robust. Uh, they will start rotating at very low speeds um, and they have high torque and they're relatively low tech. So that makes them suited for uh, a lot of uh, applications. For lift, we're looking at horizontal axis, vertical axis and translating. Mm, each have specific Advantages and disadvantages. I don't want to go through each and every one of them, but horizontal axis clearly uh, has the power takeoff underwater. Whereas if you have a vertical axis, it actually protrudes through the water surface and you can actually take your power takeoff above water level. Um, another advantage of rotating devices is that they can actually keep their speed and their momentum, their inertia all the time going. If you have something reciprocating, each time it goes from zero to acceleration to zero. Translating devices, many have tried it. I believe you do not uh, regain your efficiency loss by the simplicity of your design. So rotation is actually preferred. Some examples of vertical axis devices, they're typically omnidirectional. It means that they can handle the flow from any direction. That's quite convenient because in many tidal conditions, you do not get exactly 180 degrees flow. You get actually a deviation around a bend or uh, depending on the seabed structure. This was a project in Italy, the Cobalt. Uh, the design has been abandoned, but it has been an example project for many years. It has been uh, very carefully copied uh, in Indonesia, and they actually did a couple of projects there 
with um, uh, a vertical axis turbine which has a pitch control. It is a passive pitch, so it flaps between end stoppers. Uh, in South Korea, there is uh, a design developed by a Russian inventor Gorlov um, in Udomok, uh, and he has built a quite large installation, about one megawatt, with a helical shaped uh, vertical axis turbine. At the moment, this site in South Korea is uh, still being developed, and there is potential for about four megawatts of uh, demo projects there. Very high velocities. Vertical axis turbine in Canada, in stream. Um, this is uh, a development that also I think uh, Rainier Rijke from, uh, from Water to Energy has uh, adopted and, and, and uh, built his own machine on um, with a vertical axis turbine uh, that, uh, that is being developed here in the Netherlands. Um, ORPC is a development from the US. It is a vertical axis but then tilted in a horizontal axis. And again, you see that helical shape. The helical shape will help to reduce the torque fluctuations during its rotation. But of course, it's more complex to make those blades. Then we have an interesting development in France called HydroQuest, and they've put two turbines in a sort of duct. And they're being tested right now in a, in a river in the city of Bordeaux at a test site called Cineo, and it's a tidal river. They're uh, applying the IEC standards in order to do their performance assessment. And I think it's a very important step for them to get credibility in the market uh, about the performance. Horizontal axis turbines. Atlantis is at the moment uh, the leader uh, in the industry uh, with the largest turbine in the water. Uh, they have four turbines, uh, one developed by themselves and three developed by um, Andritz. Um, and they are installed independent first north of Or uh, Orkney. You could say it's a commercial project, but uh, in reality it is not because 70% uh, of it is public funding and they're having uh, great difficulties to, uh, uh, to do the build out the next stage of the project because at the moment the feed-in system in the UK is non-existent for marine energy. There's good hopes of getting back in there, but Brexit is uh, distracting the attention of government to really pay attention to marine energy. This is the Andritz turbine that is also being uh, installed there at the site. What is very good is that they've also followed IEC standards to do the performance assessment. And I've just been to a conference in Taiwan and they actually presented their first real power curves and real data and the performance is actually in line with their predictions, is more than 50%. And that is from a real operational turbine, one megawatt in the water. So they are really getting somewhere. Um, Notricity is a contra-rotating turbine. For time's sake, I just have to move on and show you these examples very quickly. Nova Energy, this is a uh, smaller scale turbine uh, near the Shetlands. Uh, they just got uh, funding from the EU to build uh, six of these turbines and uh, change their arrangements in the water. Uh, TU Delft, actually, through Robert Labeur and uh, Henk Polinder, are involved in a project to uh, work on the power takeoff of this device and look at the direct drive solutions. Um, Schottel Hydro uh, developed uh, a simple turbine based on their propulsion knowledge um, and also proposed an installation together with the Bluetech. This was not realized. Scott Renewables is also a big contender at the moment in the water in Orkney. As we speak, it's been taken out of the water and they're developing an even larger part of it. But this is a two megawatt device with turbines on both sides that can be hoisted in like arms and then it's easy to drag into the harbor. Magdalenas in Spain, they also developed a contra-rotating turbine, first a small one and now a large one. It's just arrived at EMEC and they're going to be testing there. So you see here some trend towards floating devices. Sabela in France installed this one on a tripod and uh, are now focusing their attention to Asia as well. And this is something we are going to hear more and more. This is um, a trend after the demise of these large corporations like Open Hydro. Open Hydro uh, was a subsidiary of Naval Energies and uh, at the peak of their moment when they uh, opened the, an assembly hall in Cherbourg in June and when they installed the turbine uh, in Canada, they actually uh, pulled the plug on the company. Um, 
it uh, meant that uh, an investment of more than 200 million euros had been stopped uh, at the moment that actually the, they were ready to, to show the world what they were worth. Um, but this has everything to do with the investor confidence. Um, and uh, without these very large corporations like Naval Energy with the deep pockets, uh, there's a very big challenge for all developers out there. And what we see is a sort of regrouping towards smaller systems floating into niche markets, moving away from the large commercial projects that we've predicted here in Europe, because the competition with grid power is still too high for marine energy. I have to move faster because otherwise we cannot deal with wave energy, but this is an interesting development. This is a completely different concept to tap and harness this uh, energy and currents. This is Minesto, it's a kite, and the kite is moving into an H shape. And as it is moving, it accelerates the flow past the blade, and underneath there, there is a turbine. And the turbine will feel maybe 10 meters per second as a relative velocity, while the actual ocean current is maybe one or one and a half meters per second. Ocean currents are not very well known in Europe, but in Asia, we have the strong effects of Coriolis right, right along the coast of Taiwan and Japan and that is where there is uh, a continuous flow in one direction similar to Florida where you have the um, I think it's the Gulf Stream very close to the uh, uh, coast so these are complete different solutions that might open up a market for much lower velocities and this is also a radically different design. This is eel energy from France. And this is, uh, yeah, move, the movement of an eel is simulated. It's like an undulated flap that, that uh, uses the, the disturbance of the water as it hits the front. And the vortexes that are created um, uh, make the flap move. And then there's like a spine. And in each spine, there is like a, a hydraulic cylinder that uh, is activated. I have to move faster, but um, this is the SME platform with shuttle turbines at the moment in the water in Scotland, near the Isle of Skye. Uh, four turbines that can be swiveled out of the water and a system that is um, uh, moored uh, at a swivel point um, and that can turn with the tides. Um, as we speak, this device, uh, its brother uh, has been installed in a passage in Canada. And the company is uh, uh, I call it confident or, or, or really focuses on these small scale <laughs> applications. They do not yet see or feel the market for large scale commercial projects. So small is beautiful was said before and um, I think that is, uh, that's very true for this sector at the moment. Um, I have to look at time very carefully. How much more? Yes, you have actually a quarter of an hour in total, including questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so then I can spend a little bit of time on this because I mentioned it before the cost of capital, COC, the cost of capital. The cost of capital, um, together with the OPEX and with the CAPEX, uh, make up the sum of your total project for 15 years. That is on the right hand side. And on your left hand side, you have the income. And at the moment, the cost of capital prevents to make you have a positive business case. Your income is decided by the feed in tariff. At the moment, there's very few feed in tariffs in the world available for tidal stream energy. In the Netherlands, you can apply for up to 12, 13 cents per kilowatt hour, but the chances of getting it are very slim. Um, and in other European countries, there is no feed-in. In Korea, there is said to be a feed-in of 22 cents per kilowatt hour, but difficult to access, and it's not yet, nobody has it yet. Uh, and Canada is actually the only country that has a small portion for the first 100 megawatts, and it has to be a community-type project, a small-scale project, and then you can get 45 Canadian dollar cents per kilowatt hour. That is why the rush is for Canada, because there's a feed-in system. It's the only place where you can make your income balance with your capex, opex, cost of capital. That cost of capital can only be reduced if we gain more confidence in the investment sector. Um, so the main 
barriers and challenges is reducing CapEx and OPEX, find strategic investors, uh, overcome the challenges of the sites, get access to grid. It's not only a problem in Sierra Leone, it's even a problem in the UK. The best places are far away and are not near a grid. Capacities in Orkney and Shetlands are limited. There's good capacity in the southwest of the UK, but there's not much tidal energy there. There's a lot of wave energy there. And we're going to see in the next presentation that wave energy is not yet ready to feed in. Uh, there's good capacity in Wales because of uh, the closure of some uh, uh, coal power and uh, nuclear power stations. So there's a tension for Wales. There's a lot of um, failures and bankruptcies in the market. And that is not good for investor confidence. And it takes a long time to develop a technology, more than 10 years. So what can we expect over the next two to five years? I hope and I believe more and more application of standards and certification on the IEC and RECRE to gain that confidence. Third party verification by certification bodies and test labs. Technology developers have to work with a certification bureau and a test lab from a very early phase on. Focus on floating systems. Smaller arrays, independent Firth, maybe an expansion in the Oosterschelde um, and around Islay. Demonstration sites in Asia, development of the force site in Canada, and more open water testing of new devices at new test facilities like Cineo uh, in Taiwan, but also at Tidal Testing Center in the Dam next year. Wave energy. What, is, what you should try to notice here is that the dots are located far away from the equator. So in the northern regions and the southern regions, that's where there's good wave potential. Another thing to notice is that actually Asia does not have a good wave potential. It has to do with its location uh, and with the Coriolis effect, the direction of the currents. Large potentials in Chile, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, and in the northern regions, Alaska, and north of Scotland, Faroe Islands, Ireland, some good potential for Portugal and north of Spain. Wave energy, I think we're going to zoom into it in the next presentations, uh, but it's a, a very complicated source of energy to harness because there are so many different types of movements. Basically, it's kinetic energy and potential energy, continuously rotating water particles, uh, moving up and down and back and forth. Um, and so there's a lot of imagination possible of how to harness this power. And there's very little consensus on what is the best solution. So you'll see that there is at least eight different directions of main categories. There's devices that can rotate directly in the current. There's overtopping devices. There's floating point absorbers. There's wave surge converters, which are completely submerged and move only back and forth. There's oscillating water columns that use the movement in the water and transfer it to a hydraulic or an air pressure. There's pitching buoys that walk up and down on the wave. There's devices that try to maximize the changing in volume. And then there's heave devices, which are submerged. And if this is not enough for variations, there's also a lot of variations on how that power is actually converted into electricity. So the power takeoff can be hydraulic, can be with air turbines, can be with water turbines, it can be direct mechanical, and can be direct electrical. Direct electrical will be a direct drive turbine, either linear or rotational. So there's a huge matrix of possibilities here. And we're looking at the oscillating water column, which is installed at Mutrico, which is in the north of Spain, a harbor with a breakwater system. And about 16 turbines have been installed there. Each time when a wave hits the breakwater, there's a water column inside the breakwater that moves up and down. And as it moves up and down, an air chamber is compressed and the compressed air hits a whale's turbine which is uh, a bi-directional turbine that can handle both this, uh, the suction and the pressure. 
the moment there's a project in Italy which is also being built uh, with a similar system in it. Of course, if you do this in the early stages of the design, you do not have to bear the cost of the civil works because that is your structure for the breakwater system. So really your cost is only that air turbine. And that's actually installed from land. So you can go there with a car and just put it there. So the economics mm -hmm. of an oscillating water column integrated in a coastal defense system are entirely different from an offshore structure. So even if there might be some, some disadvantages or lower efficiency losses than when you're near the coast, uh, the business case might be able to handle that. So you see now also an emergence of companies that are specializing in air turbines to just supply that one to other projects. One of them is AquaNet, and it's a company that's based in Taiwan uh, and uh, has a one megawatt air turbine, uh, especially for the wide market. I'm going to skip this and look at the different system. This is a point absorber developed in Sweden, it's called Seabased. Um, they've already built six turbines and actually supplied them to Ghana. I think there was a Ghanaian here in the room. Uh, that uh, project is there and is going to be expanded. There is a contract for 100 megawatts. Uh, in my view, it is quite ambitious to announce this for wave energy, but let's see what happens. They have a feed-in system um, and they have a, a takeoff uh, contract. Of course, they have to pre-finance it. And this is where the challenge is. Can they raise enough confidence in their technology to find an investor that will pre-finance the stage development of 100 megawatts? CETO is a development from Australia, uh, also a type of point absorber. And what you see here is that it is submerged. One of the challenges for wave energy is that you actually have to design it for its extreme loading conditions, survivability. And those extreme loading conditions over a period of 20 years are so much wider than your actual operational envelope, which is much smaller, and where you're going to have to earn your money back. So you're designing something for the one in 20 years, but probably the one in 100 years storm that you're going to face with your device, yet you're operating in a much benign climate. That makes your device very expensive. One way to overcome it is to try and uh, uh, duck when the wave comes. So to have a system that actually can be retracted or that is more or less most of the time underwater. Here you see another system developed here in the Netherlands by Teamwork Technology. It's called the Symphony. They have a very innovative power takeoff system that should distinguish themselves from the competition. But basically, it is a point absorber. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> um, this is like a, a pitching device that uh, follows the motion uh, of the waves and looks a little bit like maybe what people have been seeing is called the Palamus, this big sea snake that moves up and down. And here, Lincoln. What you see here is a different type of design, which is much larger than those point absorbers. And there's a good reason for it. The actual conversion from a wave into energy is quite low. Over a year, if you get 15 to 20%, you're already doing very well. So you need to have a very large projected area to the waves to try and harness all that energy. I'm going to skip all these things, but all what you see here is large structures. Uh, here's the wave piston. Again, length is important. Um, the cost of wave energy. What you start to see is that the cost starts to look a little bit like wind energy by the time you're reaching capacities of 10 to 100 megawatts. Then you are below $5,000 per kilowatt installed. At the moment for offshore wind, we're talking about two to three thousand. So we're still a huge step away from competing with other sources of renewable energy. We've heard it before in Sierra Leone, but also in the Netherlands, you have the competition with solar and wind. So why would an investor put their money in wave and tidal if you cannot show a verified power curve? Main technical challenges, mooring system, the power takeoff, electrical transmission, and materials. Um, I have to just move a little bit faster because we have only five minutes. 
I just wanted to touch on OTEC and salinity gradient. So what you see here clearly is a focus around the equator. That's the area where you have the highest temperature difference between surface water and deep water. And that is basically like a reverse fridge. You can use the temperature differential <coughs> to drive um, a fridge system and generate either electrical power or use the cold water immediately for cooling. That's probably the most effective. Conveniently around the equator, we have a lot of islands and there's a lot of holiday goers and there's a lot of resorts and they have to become more and more sustainable in their energy consumptions. They need air conditioning. So what is more beautiful than taking water from two to 300 meters deep at a constant temperature of 10, 12 degrees and actually provide free air conditioning for your hotels? It requires a very high investment to get big tubes of pipes uh, down to the sea uh, to, to get this water up. But it is a very interesting business case. So here in Delft, just around the corner, uh, Blue Rise is actually developing one of these solutions. They have a starting project on uh, the island of Curaçao. They're going to supply cold to uh, the airport into a, an agricultural uh, complex and generate a very, very, very small stream, also some electricity, to show that that system works. And then salinity gradient. Um, I don't know how to say it in English, spread based tot the building. This captures the imagination most, that you can actually generate power from fresh water and salt water, just by keeping it separate with a membrane. And using the potential difference, or the, the, the fact that the one has a higher charge than the other side, uh, like a battery, a battery of water. That's what we all want. And there's good places around the world, and here it is scattered, all around the world where there is large bodies of water flowing into the sea and where you have a short distance between um, between the between the two, the fresh and the salt water. So this is a, a, a test a pilot by Red Stack on the Afla Dive and they are now preparing a project for Kapwai. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Time actually has passed, so I give you possibility for one question and then after then there is a lunch where we are all together. So is there any question? One. Okay, that is the one. I think it's been very interesting. Yes. I have a question. Uh, you were talking about gaining the confidence of the investors. And also I saw a point about the big, uh, huge development companies. Construction in different areas of uh, technical areas, simulation has been used to both gain the confidence of the investor and shorten the life of the others. Do you see this simulation used at its, at, its, at its full potential to deal with this kind of uh, application? Um, of course, simulation is extremely valuable in the R&D phases. Uh, but also later on in predicting uh, the performance at other sites. It is very important, of course, that the simulations are validated uh, and validated with real data. Um, and this is where the uncertainty comes in, is that the data is usually generated by the developer who makes those models. And um, there's very little uh, 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 data and validated models in the public domain. And uh, so uh, just simulation uh, as part of building confidence, I find it uh, still very weak. It's also my experience. Yeah. Maybe we can change that. Yes, so validated yeah. models, validated models with real data. And the more and more projects that come in the water, the more and more we can actually show that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very quick, huh? Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, the wind carriers are not a place for a lot of island and space. So, why is that? Because it's, it's more or less a sort of governmental policy. And what, what is necessary uh, to have that, for example, in the Netherlands? Uh, because we, we see that as, a big, uh, as one of the biggest issues for us as a great uh, energy company. Yeah, that's a very important uh, point you raise. Um, this is something that we've been battling with, with the government. 
is to uh, make space for like an innovation feed-in system whereby you uh, earmark some funds for innovative technologies that uh, depend on a feed-in for their implementation and that can actually can access to a little bit higher feed-in than, uh, than, than well-established technologies. But at the moment, Dutch government has set a policy of uh, priority for the cheapest solution. So uh, the cheaper the solution, you get access to your funding. And the government really wants to get rid of long-term subsidies. So, yeah, this is just the economics of how it works. The ambition, I must say, on this front of the energy system in the Netherlands is very nationally focused. And uh, nationally focused in terms of achieving its CO2 reductions. And has very little eye at the moment for export potential and for the European uh, policies that we are trying to achieve. It's a European market we are uh, pursuing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank presentation. You okay. Now it, it is the turn of Massimo Previani from Italy, from RSC Ricerca, and he will speak about the wave energy generator. Uh, okay, Massimo. How oh, yeah. you? Fish levels. Inflate the fish. Yeah, so but now? Oh, okay, it works. Do you want to say just by saying yes, uh, one, uh, a few remarks on that? Both uh, uh, what I've heard uh, in, the, in the industry is both that uh, the technology of fish ladders or fish migration systems are still, uh, still need to be investigated and optimized because uh, it doesn't <coughs> always work in, in an optimal way. Uh, and also, uh, as you mentioned, uh, low head uh, couple of turbines uh, have been stating that they are fish friendly, but it turns out, I heard in, Ger in Germany especially, that their fish mortality rates are higher than expected in, uh, from the start. Kaplan is still the problematic. Yes. <coughs> this is the reason why Aldrin in, in the West made the, the spiral Kaplan. Yeah. You can say also to, to, to reduce it. But it's uh, it's getting better. And the fish ladders are connected with the size and the type of the fish. We have exactly in Salzburg where I'm living, the power plant in the town, and we have two fish ladders in one house for two different fish, uh, main yeah. fish hubs. This is the solution. Exactly. We have, well, we are starting 12 minutes later, so we will have lunch 12 minutes later, but it's still reasonable. Okay, Maximo, we okay. have now 20 minutes. Uh, my name is Maximo Bergiani. I'm working in uh, RSD, uh, which is a research center in Milano, which is devoted to the sustainability of the energy system in Italy. It's a private institute, but it's belonging itself is working for the Ministry of Economy. First of all, thank you very much, Sandra, and thank you very much, Milo, for the opportunity to be in this meeting, which is really very interesting with very wide, you know, uh, presentations. And also the opportunity to have the students right here to, to listen also to, to, to all these explanations, but also an extra value to the short boxes. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, 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 a new device, and as Peter, thank you very much for introducing all the technologies because now the audience is much aware of it. It is like this, really like like Peter was saying. I mean, we are in the front line, let's say, on the development of let's say devices to get this difficult energy or let's say complicated energy that we have in in waves. So the presentation will be by Zebelli on the basis of the conceptual design, numerical analysis, and the different stage in order to arrive to a certain technological readiness level that will be able, you know, to bid certain confidence to the investors in order to try to uh, go for commercialization. So. So first of all, uh, there are several, let's say, types of, uh, of wave converters. Uh, some of them are just near, they say, the shore, or on the shore, like Greenpet, that was already explained it. Some are in the neighborhood of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the shore, and some are offshore. When you go far from the shore, it is 
becoming you know more and more expensive because you it, you have to you know to make maintenance in the open sea and also you need you know a connection to the grid which is quite very 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 expensive so the energy so let's look to the to the power we, re we really have so i must say that i'm coming from a small hydropower in the rivers okay all my life i was working in the rivers and not in the sea but for chance, I had the opportunity to teach at the university in Latusha with a colleague, which is in the, just in front of the port. I say, why not to try small hydropowers in the sea as well? You know, and that, that was the idea. And this idea is already with two brevets, European brevets, uh, deposited in, in, in the paper. So the, the point is this one: the waves move in this more or less in this way. I mean, you have. A uh, great, great uh, let's say, transport of energy, but few transport of, 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 of water, let's say, modern. And also, the, uh, the energy is more or less concentrated in the upper part of the, of, 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 of the sea. So if you go in deep, it will almost disappear. Let's say, I always say to my students that if there is, a, 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 let's say, a tsunami, if they are diving, they will not feel the tsunami because it will pass over them because it disappears. And also, the other thing is that when you arrive to the, to, the, to the coast, it will get influenced by the morphology of the sea. And so waves will try to, 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 to keep together and also to rise, okay? And you will lose also energy. So how to get this, uh, you know, to so capture, you know, this energy, in what way what could be do? So we are, Italy is inside, uh, let's say, a lake. Not a sea, you know, because in the Mediterranean Sea, compared with the, with the North Sea or the oceans, we don't have too much weight. But nevertheless, uh, it is quite constant. I mean, so the idea is that we could, we should develop a device that can work also with, let's say, waves that are from, on the range from two to uh, four, four or five meters. Let's say from two to four meters, and also it has to be flexible. I mean, it can be. Uh, use it and, uh, and apply it in some existing structures, for example, in the in the in, in the breakwaters of the ports or in the small, let's say, uh, uh, deportive store or breakwaters. And so there are several structures. In, uh, in Italy, we have you know a lot of coast, but also a lot of tourism and a lot of structures already existing there. And if you could take advantage of these structures, then the cost would be much less. The other thing is the replicability. I mean, we are thinking of something that can be modular. So we make one, two, ten, hundred thousand. I mean, so we can have flexibility on the on the production and also on the uh, let's say on the investment uh, to So here I will explain the study on one unit. You know, but imagine that it can be can be also hundred, hundred, let's say, hundred units. Okay, the, the system is quite simple, so it's just putting, let's say, a, a tube, just for say, an oscillating, an oscillating, let's say, column inside the water, so we have waves, the mean sea level is over here, waves move outside, and water come in and come out, okay, this is the way. And this is, this oscillating column is connected to the sea by a kind of intake, let's say, a structure, we will be, be, make better, let's say, the, uh, the, 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 the flow through the turbine. We were thinking on different shapes, shapes of this, of this, uh, of this oscillating column and also intake, and also different solutions on the hydraulic turbine. So you can, the first thing is that you have flow which is changing direction. So one solution is to use one of the directions and then put at one direction of the turbine. The other solution is to use both the, the flow up and the flow down, but it means you should go for a turbine that is having your symmetric turbine, in which you get, you know, uh, the, the power in two directions, but of course, this turbine is less efficiency than the one direction turbine. So this is a kind of balance, okay? Which are, so we found out that we will start with this, which is a type of well, of wells turbine, but is used in the water. The first analysis is uh, with numerical modeling. So numerical modeling. So let's try to see how the turbine is working, and these are simulations related to different shapes of the of the intake and also different 
shapes of the blades and number of blades of the of the turban. The straightforward one we try to evaluate how much is the power, you know, because you have we have the, the, the energy of the waves with energy uh, like in the in the readers, it is 0 0.5 multiplied by the wave height square, okay, multiplied by the period. You see? I mean, also the larger of this the, 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 the wave the wave time, okay, it, it goes to square, and the larger is the period, is the largest is the available energy we, we can get. Of course, only part of this energy could be used, you know, for generation. So we have a hydraulic, let's say, power, which is related to the amount of water and amount of and, and, and heat we can generate, you know, inside and outside the device. So the other point is to see to see uh, how to, we develop that. So there is a project, it was already mentioned before, it is a Marinette project. It's a really very good project because the European Union was putting money in order to try to develop it, new ideas, you know, from technological readers level almost zero, like it was this one, so one means I just have an idea, uh, 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 bringing, you know, uh, the, the device to the, the, the uh, stage of, uh, of uh, commercial commercial deployment. Let's say. So the uh, first, uh, it means you have to follow this, this let's say, this protocol by doing uh, studies uh, in different scale in order not to go directly to the sea. I have seen several ideas that are going directly to the sea and it will, they will, uh, they will, they will fall fast because, you know, this is, the sea is much more complicated than the lab. So already the lab, you know, is, is, is difficult to have a device which is working and the sea is completely different. So many, uh, you know, the bridge in the valley uh, sometimes they fall down because they didn't follow, you know, the right way to try to develop the, the, the devices, they say. So this, this is also an example of what to do. So the first uh, analysis was to analyze, you know, the different solutions, uh, uh, different solutions in the, in the lab that was in, in Cork, in the Cork University, just by changing different, let's say, shapes of the intake and different diameters of the oscillating water column in order to try to get the best, the best, uh, the best design. And that was a model like this, you know, very, very small one, okay? But it was enough in order to understand if the idea was good and how, how, how it could work. So these are some of the examples, the different solutions. And the main thing uh, you have to look over here is how much is the, the response amplitude operator. I mean, how much is the energy you get inside your oscillating water column compared with the energy you have uh, on the wave outside. So this is the, the, this is the idea. The second stage is to try to deploy, let's say, or to study a device which is a larger one and in which you already have more detailed a, a part of it. For example, in this case, already having the turbine and already having here measuring the torque and measuring also the rotational speed in order to be able to understand how much is the mechanical power we can get in the, in the, in the axis. Okay, so we have hydraulic with wave power, hydraulic power, mechanical power by rotation, and then we have to, to transform this energy in electrical power. So there are different steps of transfer energy transformation that you have to, to analyze and improve, let's say. Okay, here we have more or less a, a movie. Hope it will work. Okay, it is working. So this is one of the tests, you know, that was a, a regular wave of more or less 80 centimeters, it means. The model is one five, it means it is more or less like four meters waves, which are the waves we have in the in the Mediterranean Sea during, during uh, winter and springtime. So you saw that it's just, you know, water coming in and up and then there is a rotating, rotating in, in the top of it. The, the possibility here is to try to understand, so this rotation is just due to the water coming in and coming out. And uh, here there are the speed, the speed, let's say, measurement, and here is the torque measurement. 
and then by multiplying these two factors, you can get how much is the mechanical power you have in the axis. Okay. The next, let's say, and that was quite promising because at least we, we could measure, let's say, energy in the axis, which is not, you know, you, you could imagine that there is energy, but when you measure, you know, it, it, it is proven that it is like this. So uh, the, the results uh, attracted the attention of our main, let's say, actor in the energy sector in Italy, which is uh, energy in power. Okay, so they say, okay, I, I think it's really nice, so we will, uh, let's say, invest on uh, further studies. And then we put it already the, uh, the electrical generator in order to measure how much is the energy we actually can produce, electrical energy, okay? And that was done in CRM, uh, in CM, which is a, a very good, I mean, famous institute for naval, let's say, uh, modeling study, model study, okay? It is based in Rome, and it is partner also of Marino and Marino II. Uh, it's a lab that is mainly the, the related to ships, you know, so waves are quite concentrated. Five minutes? Five minutes. Ten minutes. Five, okay. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the solution, the solution here was, it was also to have the electrical generator, okay, so this is how it looks like in the, in the lab. Here are the, the controls, okay, and here we have the, 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 the device, the axis and so on, and the, the way is this one, you know, is the, the blue one is the oscillation of the waves outside the device, okay. And the, and, the, and the red line is the oscillation inside. So we, in a certain moment, you see, we have inside this level and outside this level. I mean, we have a water head, you know, like we have in the small hydro power, right? So what do we try to do to move and so on? The idea is to try to, you know, to do this as better as possible in order to get the maximum profit, okay? Other important thing is how to how to control the turbine, because here the energy is not a constant energy like you have in the rivers or when it is the wind. We have oscillating energy. It means the turbine has to follow this energy and it has also to be oscillating and you have to control, you know. So in this, in this, in this test, as we were uh, discovering what will be the best control of the turbine. It means if the turbine is slow down, we will put a little bit of energy, but when it is getting in the, in the, in the good, let's say, uh, uh, zone of, 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 of efficiency, we will let the turbine there in order to produce, okay? So we receive energy, we give a little bit when it is necessary. Of course, the balance has to be positive, you know, so it's, this is for sure, otherwise we are just at the... Okay, okay here, are, here are some, another movie of the, of the last test. So this is very how, how it works, you see? So this is how it is working, so oscillating, you know, the, 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 the water uh, uh, inside and outside. <coughs> and then uh, here is the, 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 the axis, we have, we can add inertia if we, got, if we, if we want here, but it was necessary. Here is the electric, electric a generator, and here are the batteries in which we charge the energy we are getting from the waves. Okay? This is the point. Okay. Next, next, next. Uh, so the next uh, study will be to deploy the device in a real, in the real sea. Okay, this, uh, this is the port of Civitavecchia, which is near Rome, and this is how it looks when you have your normal, let's say, the, this is a quite small uh, waves, a little bit less than one meter. I mean. But imagine that this is the oscillation that in which in which the device could be deployed and uh, and, and and have it uh, as a okay as a guy which is so next week we are going to start with the tests in the in the port okay so we we, we are now installing the say the device with the fixed in the in the in the in the breakwater and protecting it against waves and so on. And we do some testing uh, during uh, uh, October because it is the moment in which we don't have too much waves, you know, because we, we have a, a device which is a scale 25, so we want to have waves of one meter or one meter across, which means five meters in the in the in the one-to-one in the, in the, in the uh, case. 
Okay, what is the prediction of this energy? The prediction is that each unit, each unit, I mean, the idea is to have a kind of battery, you know, a, a, a pen float, you know, one just beside the other, all along the, 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 the castles of the break water. But each one, concerning these studies we already did, would be in Civitavecchia, which is not the, the, the largest area of energy, could be, you know, each one on the side of 12 to 18 kilowatts and could produce about 6 to 10 gigawatt hour, which means the energy that can supply two or three families, okay? But if we go to other side, and Italy here, you see, this is the, the energy, wave energy map of Italy. We see that in the, in the uh, Liguria and also in Sardinia and in the southern part of Sicily, is the area in which we have the highest energy availability, okay? So in Sardinia we have 103 megawatts hour per meter of the front, of the, of the way front. Uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Sicily we have half of it, and in Chilita Vecchia we have even half of this. So, so we are here in the, in the area of having 25% of the energy we would have in Sardinia. So it means that the device is site dependent. So larger is the other way, larger is the device and larger is the energy production. So we expect that each unit should fit very easily at least 10 families. And it is very useful in the isolated islands, you know, because in Italy also isolated islands you have to bring ships to, to burn oil, you know, very smelly and, and, and with a high environmental impact. So it, it could be uh, use it, uh, is it for that, and also by integrating with other renewals, for example, uh, photovoltaics or, or, or wind production. Okay, so the first things we have to know is this graph, which is graph is more or less like the flow duration curve for us in the rivers. It means it says for a certain amount of wave height and wave period, how much is the energy you have along the year. Okay? <laughs> Rapid means most of the time we have this type of condition in Chilita Vecchia, but anyway. So you have to design your device for these conditions, which are the more powerful ones, okay? Also, the, the period in which this device will work is more or less six months, it's 0.5, which is very good. Since that solar panels, they work for much less of them, okay? So it's also kind of sustainable. And the prediction of waves are much better than the prediction of sunshine and, and, and wind, let's say. So more predictable, let's say. Okay, some conclusions. Some conclusions is that, okay, modular design and flexibility are quite, quite good. The, it is necessary to improve a little bit uh, more uh, how, to, uh, how to save the device when there is a storm, okay, because we can see there will be crashes, so we are taking to to drop down to the bottom of the sea, the device when there is a prediction of, 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 of the storms. Also, uh, uh, better, you know, it's better to, it's, it would be better to, to, to make, you know, to, to, to optimize the, 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 the capex and opex. It means that now we are in the size of uh, the price of the device compared with the income of money you can get. Is a little bit high, it's more or less three times more than what we expect. But think about that during the panel, the solar panels development, the solar panel in the very beginning couldn't pay even the money, you know, that, that was invested to construct it. It was in the very beginning. It, it is why the lesser cost of energy of the, of, the, of, of the new technology will drop down for sure. And when you are thinking that you will win 100 or 1,000, the cost will really drop with that. The idea is to have simple materials in order to be changeable, okay? I have to finish. And changeable it means it's better to do something you can replace than to have too much heavy and, and, and expensive. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. This is okay. Actually, the time is over, but so there is room for one question and then there is, will be a lunch, uh, lunch question. Does anybody want to have a question? You have a question. Quick one. <laughs> so to to um, balance out the energy and fiber to the storage, uh, in, uh, what do you say, fly wheel, fly wheel, 
you put energy in to keep it rotating, why don't you store it into uh, The question why, 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 why do you, why you not give the energy? energy in, the, in, the, in the flying wheels, for example, where, where you have these small drops of the energy, where you are not producing, why are you not using flywheels or some other technology to store the energy? To store, no, to store the energy, we store it in a battery. Yeah, but we put also energy in to keep it uh, uh, so rotating at the same speed. No, 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 no. Okay. It, it is like a. How to say? You please switch on and switch out the device when you want. Then, so that is this one. If I have the weight, con I, if I say I have a weight condition, you switch on. When I switch on, the the control system, you start to put the, the turbine in a certain in a certain velocity, in the range, a certain velocity. It will also let the turbine to oscillate, as I, as I said, because this is much more profitable. Okay. If if the balance. Uh, of, 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 of keeping the to find there will be higher than the balance of the energy, you have to just switch off and say, okay, these are not the weight conditions I need. Okay? If, on the other side around, if you put on this, you, 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 so you give a small amount of energy just to keep the turbine working in the in proper way. Yes. Sometimes, due to the from the from the test we did the last, you don't need to put any energy because it is just oscillating at itself. Your question is what should I do with the energy I'm producing? No, no, no. My question was just about your point of putting a little bit of energy in. Yes. So if you have it already stored in a, a, a flying flywheel, then it keeps your. Uh, ah, yes, yes, I understand. No, the point is that they, there are two points of this. I understand the question. There are two points. The first one is that the amount of energy that is being. First of all, when, uh, due to the fact that you have to turbine, you have to give energy. If you have uh, how to say a wheel in order to keep to keep in action, it will be a higher energy you have to put. This is the, the second is that you don't know exactly how much energy you have to be to, to, to input because weights are irregular, you know. It is why. But we started to think about that and we see that we have the wheel that we will be putting some weight in order to get in action. It didn't work. So thank you very much for the patience. Okay, Maximo, thank you. Okay. Thank Our game for you. Okay, now we have Meryl Fairbeck speaking <laughs> from few delts. Uh, go ahead, Meryl. Thank you. I'm a PhD candidate in two delts, and I'm uh, working on the, one of the first uh, built uh, tidal arrays in the world. So the turbines placed next to each other in the Oosterschelde. Um, and I'm talking today about environmental monitoring of this uh, installation. Um, I like to focus today on the impact of the, of the tidal turbines on the environment uh, of this specific installation. Um, in, uh, for you to understand, uh, to place the project a bit in, uh, in the context, I will shortly also talk about production a bit more in general. And of course, it's important to, to, to learn about this type of technologies because we like to generate energy in a renewable, renewable kind of way. Uh, Peter introduced you already into, uh, into tidal energy. Tidal energy is uh, a very predictable uh, type of technology when comparing it to wind energy, to solar energy. You can predict it 100 times in advance, and you know exactly um, when uh, it's going to, your turbine is going to produce. Um, compared to wind, it has the advantage that the, the, the energy of water has a higher energy density, which means uh, like the the density of water is 100 times uh, higher, but the velocities are only 10 times smaller. So you need much smaller ro rotors or smaller turbines. The, the potential source around the world is around 3% uh, uh, of the total primary energy supply in 2013. Uh, was quantified, and this is not part of my studies, but it's uh, to give you a general idea. And Peter highlighted that this is really a niche market. So some countries could get 60% uh, of their energy need from tidal energy, for example, England, if they would use their source uh, correct, uh, if they would use their sources in other places, there is almost none. Uh, there are three ways to harvest this type of energy. Um, you could fully constrain the flow, this is where most of you know the um, tidal energy from, like for, for example, the big, uh, 
Baritis, for example, in Lavage. To partly constrain the flow, this is one of the new technologies which is re becoming really popular, is dynamic tidal power. You need very long, uh, uh, very long barrier which is running across the coast, approximately 10 meter, uh, kilometers long, to uh, get enough head. So this is also working on head differences. And the technology I, I talked to you about today is about turbines that generate the, the energy from the flow. And in this typology, it's, it's called the unconstrained uh, tidal energy. It's actually using free stream turbines. So that's the, the, the type that looks like wind turbines, uh, like the one over here. And um, yeah, Peter has shown you many examples. And the Oschelde uh, case that I will t t talk to you about today is uh, also using this free stream turbine. So the turbines do not fully block the flow. Uh, part of the flow can, can actually pass which is maybe positive also for environmental impact. Um, when you are going to build such a new type of technology, you should prove that you have, uh, that your, what your environmental impact is. Uh, this you need uh, for certification, for example. Uh, when I talk about environmental impact, I mean the changes to the ecolo ecology, for example, changes in nutrients, uh, nutrients going into to your basin when your turbines block part of your basin entrance or changes in the navigation of uh, mammals, sea mammals in your basin. Changes in morphology, both locally, the you could imagine that turbines bypass the flow, maybe uh, impact the bed, or further in your basin impact the intertidal, uh, intertidal areas or the flats in your basin, which might mean uh, high ecological value. And changes in hydrodynamics, which I mean the changes in your flow, so the changes uh, in your um, for example, in the, the tidal amplitude, the amount of water that's going in and out of your basin, for example. And it can also be local hydrodynamic changes. For example, changes in turbulence. Um, I'm actually part of a big monitoring project of one of these, of these first built turbines that are placed in an array uh, and also inside a, a coastal structure. The installed capacity of, the, of these turbines is 1.2 megawatts. And um, they produce approximately 4,000 households in the southern part of the Netherlands. They're connected to the grid already. Um, there are five turbines, and they're in one of these gates and of the full storm surge barrier. It's an attractive location. It's a, it's a, it's a low, uh, you could say it's a low head situation, uh, because the, the water level difference is only one meter, but the flow velocities locally are up to five meters a second, which makes it interesting for this form of uh, tidal energy. Um, as part of my PhD, I'm, I'm working on a, in a research project with a lot of other researchers from Utrecht University, from Deltades, um, uh, uh, from Delft uh, University, also uh, another researcher. Um, Wageningen Marine Research to uh, look to eco the ecological effects of this tidal power plant. It's um, located over here. Here you can see the basin of the of the Oceanschelde, um, and this is the location of the tidal power plant. The basin um, is actually uh, when it's since it was uh, blocked by the storm surge barrier. Uh, it's it's um, the tidal flats in this in this basin are de deteriorating. They're becoming lower, and this is a problem in in this area. So one of the main questions also of this project is. What do the, will the, tower, the, the power plant add to this ongoing dynamics in this basin to be more, more dynamics? Here you can see also the flats. <coughs> um, and then I, I'd like to highlight how this project is a bit set up. We have researchers working on the near field. It's for example me and Deltades uh, working for example on the estimation of the drag that these turbines pose to this entrance of the basin. Um, so uh, yeah, this, this estimation you need to predict, for example, the effect on, um, on morphology in the remaining part of the basin. So this is a map of the Oceanschelde. And in yellow, you can see the, the intertidal areas. So these, uh, these places. And um, yeah, on all these scales, we are we're doing research like to the, to the uh, 
the impact of these turbines to the to the environment or to, to the flow. Um, today, I like to focus mostly on the estimation of the drag of these turbines. How much resistance do they actually uh, add to the system? Or, uh, because that's of course important to estimate morphological changes in the basin. Um, so, uh, uh, other questions that are part of the project is to estimate how the ecology is affected. My colleagues are doing this, especially in Wageningen Marine Research. They're looking to the navigation of sea mammals in the basin. Um, one of the questions which, which, uh, which we would like to uh, answer in the end is, could we upskill tidal energy at this location? Um, is uh, our environmental impact uh, uh, so little that you could uh, use more of these of this currents that are passing the storm surge barrier? And how could, uh, how could you translate this, this knowledge to other sites around the world? Here, um, I, uh, I shortly highlight the content of my, my project as part of this project. I'm working on the prediction of uh, actually the drag of these turbines, local, the local flow changes that they at um, I, I do this using mon monitoring of the full-scale flow, uh, using laboratory uh, tests, and also using theory. And this is important for the morphological questions, but also to assess uh, the stability of the bed locally um, at the storm surge barrier. Well, you could think that's quite an easy task. You just measure the drag of one turbine, and you can add up maybe for other turbines or for other places in the storm surge barrier. But actually, uh, summing resistances like you would be doing in electrical engineering, it's not that simple in uh, when you put a turbine in the flow. Yeah, otherwise, I won't be doing a PC, of course. Stop. So, how does this apply, or does this apply to the drag of turbines in the, in the field? So, actually, we are measuring as one of this is really really special chance. We are measuring the the, the drag or all the loads on the turbines in the field to see what's, what's actually the drag on, of one turbine and of the array of the turbines. And we also measure the flow, flow velocities. Here you can see a cross-section um, of the storm surge barrier, and this is how the turbines are mounted. And you can see they're, they're very close to the, to the barrier also, uh, placed to the barrier. Um, when, what, one of the things that we see in the, in the field measurements and also in, exper in experiments is that you cannot simply add also the drag of the turbine with the drag of the, of the storm surge barrier. So what you would do if you would, would do the large scale modeling of the whole basin, just want to put some drag in your, in your, in your barrier, additional drag, and then calculate what are the morphological changes. But actually there is an interaction between these two. Um, we see that the turbines in, in the field measurements, we see the turbines, they, they reduce the, the, the turbulence, the, so the locally, the, the large structures present in the flow. Uh, we could confirm this also with the CFD model of, uh, of, of Deltares, also working on this, um, on this topic. I could already, using uh, theoret theoretical modeling, you could predict uh, the drag <laughs> of, this, of, this, of this sum of these two. But for, for me, now the main message here is that the combined resistance, the combined resistance of this system is less than summing just the drag of the barrier with the drag of the turbines. It becomes even more complex because the turbines are placed in an array. Um, this is one of the field observations we do in the field. Here you see the lateral distance, and this is the streamwise distance. It's the top view of the installation. And um, actually, in blue, you can see low lower velocities when the turbines operate, and in, or in pink you see higher velocities. So in between the turbines you see a speed up of the flow. And this actually already shows you that these turbines, they are interacting. And you could also, um, you want to take into account here to a theoretical model which predicts the drag on this total array, that these turbines interact, they communicate with each other. And they are not similar to placing one turbine in the, in the sea, when you put them closely, closely to each other, the drag it's actually slightly, uh, yeah, it, 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 of this system is slightly less. Okay, you could even go further and say the, 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 the drag uh, also is, uh, 
You could also talk about the communication of the different gates in the storm surge barrier. For now, I like to skip this part because I think we have little time. But in the end, I'm working now on, on this theoretical model um, that uh, should take into account uh, the drag of one turbine in a storm surge barrier. This is where we developed the theoretical model. We can predict uh, what the drag is of the turbine when it's uh, mounted inside a structure. And uh, we like to include the, the interaction with, with the neighboring turbines on which we have a lot of data also from the field and the communication between the different gates in the storm surge barrier. And we will, we will do this also partly using numerical modeling of this system. And with this, um, we, we actually saw that there is a nonlinear addition of these different drags of these turbines uh, in the system, which is not the same as you would at the resistances uh, in, 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 in electrical engineering. Um, well, actually, the, the, the current mor morphological researchers are already running a, a hydrological model at the scale of the whole basin to predict morphological changes in the basin. And uh, they have used a very conservative approach. So they have used actually uh, just the drag of one turbine and they multiplied it as much turbines as they want to have in the basin. And they already see for the current installation that the morphological changes are really minor compared to ongoing dynamics. The dynamics because the barrier was constructed there. And you could imagine that with these results together that you uh, would uh, predict even less morphological changes in your basin as a result of these um, turbines that are now in the water. Which is encouraging because also Tocardo has a permit to put turbines in the water in the gate next to the ones that are now in the water. Um, yeah, other questions uh, on the stability of the bed protection will also be part of this later. For now, the, uh, I like to talk about a little bit still about the horizon. You have seen that the extra drag that the turbine is exposed to the to the barrier is less um, than just the, the drag that the then summing the individual drag of the turbine with the barrier. That the morphological effects are still of this current installation are quite minor. And um, my colleagues uh, who work on the navigation of the mammals in the, in the basin, they are seeing no changes so far in the navigation paths of the, of the mammals and no, no mammal was hit yet by a turbine, I think. Um, whether we could upskill tidal energy over here is, I think, uh, more of a political question when we're discussing about the next um, gate with turbines. But of course you could imagine that there is a threshold you cannot uh, continue filling these uh, gates with turbines because certainly the morphological effects will be uh, become really large, uh, become larger, and um, you have to uh, be careful, especially in this this system, which is quite uh, sensitive to change. Um, and definitely, you could use these tools also if you are implementing a turbine in other sites in a in a storm surge barrier, which which is here shown to be quite attractive location for tidal energy generation. And of course, I'm interested if there are questions.